I hope my screen is visible. Yes, please. Okay. So when it comes to advanced taxation practice, we are examining your acumen in the Ghanaian tax laws, taxation in Ghana. And the whole thing is that everything you have learned in your lower levels is still examinable under advanced taxation. But however, they tend to, you know, make the syllabus focus primarily on issues around tax plan. Is that okay? So when it comes to advanced taxation, first of all, I'm going to break down the way your paper is structured. Then we take it one at a time. I hope that sounds fair and simple. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Yes, sir. So, first things first, let's see how the paper is structured. So, I'm going to break it into five periods. Okay. So, the first area. Let me make it questions rather because what you'll be doing with the questions. So let's say I break it into question one, okay, which will become tax planning, okay, tax planning, avoidance, and anti avoidance, right? So this is the first area. Okay? This is the first area that. You have to have complete knowledge of. The reason why I make this a face area is that no matter the question that comes, sometimes all the questions have something around tax planning in them. Do you get? Then the next area that you are going to focus on is international taxation. Okay, so international jurisdiction. However, these areas are also part of international tax. But most of the time, I like to separate international taxation into DTA or double taxation issues. Then we talk about question three. Question three being tax incentives. Question three being tax incentives. Question four being the taxation of income. Let me call it corporate tax liabilities. Okay. corporate tax liabilities, and then question five, or the fifth area being, um, what do we call it? I call it ethics and administration. Okay. Ethics, administration, and communication with tax authorities. Okay. Communication with clients, and tax authorities. So these are the five areas for your advanced taxation exam. Are we okay? So with this being said, let's immediately go into the first area. I hope you are writing it down because there are some few things that you also have to look at before the paper begins. Are we okay? But you must note that some of these questions are not going to be straightforward for you. They are going to be mixed up, especially when it comes to things around tax avoidance, okay? And anti-avoidance provisions. They are going to be mixed up. So in your, your duty as a question, uh, as a student, in your advanced taxation exam is to identify the issues at hand and try to work. Identify how it's, impacts the particular question that they are giving you and how maybe if it has to do with some computation, how it's going to affect the computation. Are you done now? Can I move? Can I move? Yes. Yes, please. Okay, so let's see. So the first area is what? Tax planning, avoidance, and what? And anti-avoidance, right? So 
One thing you have to know here is that, first of all, what is tax planning? That's the first ever question. And ICA can ask you, basically, what is tax planning? So you have to know tax planning and its intended what objectives. Okay, That's the first thing you have to know. What is tax planning and its intended objective? So when we say tax planning, what do we understand by tax planning? In simple terms, tax planning has to do with what? Arranging your financial activities in such a way that what? You get access to all the tax benefits, the incentives, the deductions. Are you getting it? The concessions under the law. You get the idea. So plan, a plan is particularly somebody's what? Arrangement of his financial activity. So when we say tax planning, we are talking about how you can arrange what? Your financial activities, right? To make sure that you enjoy all the possible benefits under the law. So some people say careful judicious planning around taxes to make sure that you do not pay more than you're expected to pay under the law. And you are also what? Going to the end result is to minimize your tax liability, obviously. You get it. So we are saying that if you arrange your financial activities in such a way that what provides maximum benefits by making and by making what use of all the beneficial provisions in the tax laws, you are doing tax planning, right? So a tax plan is simply a plan that avails all what benefits somebody is going to get so that he does not pay more than he's expected to pay under the law and to, to minimize his tax liability. So that's tax planning, right? Now, what are the objectives of tax planning? This question has come before. Tax planning and its intended objectives for 10 marks. So that was tax planning, right? Tax planning is 100% legal and it is the intelligent application of expert knowledge in the planning of taxes. Now, the next thing you have to talk about are the objectives of tax planning. If you plan, remember I told you tax planning is legal. So if tax planning is legal, if you plan, what are the objectives of tax planning? What does tax planning try to achieve? First of all, the main reason is to minimize your tax liability. That's the first objective, right? Which we've seen here, to minimize what? Your tax liability. Now, because you can get access to all the concession, or if you properly arrange your activities, you can get access to your concessions and all that, you can reduce your tax liability. But the same way, if you are working within the framework of the law, then nobody is going to sue you. So the second objective here is to minimize litigation, right? The third objective is to what? Bring about productive investment, right? Because the tax laws are designed in a way that they want you to invest in tax favored investment, right? Investments that what are tax favored. So government will intentionally bring up treasury bills so that you buy, right? And we know that interest on treasury bill is exempt from tax. That's a productive investment, which will help everyone, right? Helps government also helps you as well, right? So we channel your taxable or your incomes into these ventures. And because of this productive investment, remember, um, you will generate good money because it's within the framework of the law. You are not hiding from anybody and it will lead to the healthy growth of the economy. So that is also one point. Also, it brings about economic stability, right? Because you can mobilize resources for national projects. So government brings tax planning, uh, tax planning initiatives, basically so that you can do development. You get the idea. So if we are doing proper tax planning, channeling our income into various investment plans, well, definitely there'll, there'll be economic stability because everybody is planning within the framework of the law. Nobody's trying anything illegal, right? Also, that is one of the objectives. And finally, to create employment for people. That is the last one, right? So tax planning creates employment. That is why people are learning tax, right? So that they can become consultants, advisors, practitioners, I get it, tutors. It's all employment, right? Okay, so that is tax planning and its intended objectives. Now, the next thing you have to know is tax avoidance, tax avoidance and tax evasion schemes, okay? So first of all, what is tax avoidance and what is tax evasion? Tax avoidance is simply what? Creating artificial transactions, right? So with tax planning, tax avoidance, what we do is that we create artificial transactions or sometimes not artificial, artificial or what, real transactions. Sometimes that 
the transactions are not artificial. They are real. They are actually happening, right? But the main purpose is to exploit loopholes in the tax law, right? So to exploit what? Loopholes in the tax law. Okay. And it is actually a legal way of doing it. It's actually legal. But in real life, tax avoidance can be illegal. It depends on the excessiveness of it, right? And sometimes we mostly say, even if it's not legal, even if it could be legal, it could be unethical or illegitimate, okay? Because some transactions are too excessive, okay? Let me give you a typical example. So here, the word I want you to use in exam is the artificial. That's the way we are looking for. Creating artificial transactions. Artificial <laughs> transactions to exploit loopholes in the law. So what we are saying is that when I visit section 10, right? When I visit, when I visit section 10 of the Income Tax Act, Okay. You realize one thing. It says what? If only I borrow money, right? If I borrow money, and how much this noise is what I would like. Eh? Oh. If I borrow money and then I use it to either what acquire an asset in my business or I use it to fund my working capital, right? In accordance with section 10. Then the interest component, okay, the interest component on this is an allowable deduction. Do you all agree? Yes, that's what the law says. Okay, now the law didn't specify where to borrow this money. Okay, it didn't specify where, it didn't specify from whom I'm going to borrow money from, right? So this alone is a loophole. Why is it a loophole? It's a loophole because since you didn't specify, I can decide to go and borrow a loan from my mother. And you know, my mother can give me interest rate. I get to this. So look at it. Too. If I go and borrow a loan from my mother, my mother can what? Manipulate the interest rates. Either the interest rate, right? So manipulation of the interest rate. And my mother will say, okay, I want you to pay 100% interest. Because the loss and I use the money to go and buy an asset or finance my business, there should be a deduction for it, right? Yes, of course. Because I, I, I actually use the loan to acquire an asset or fund my working capital, right? Two, the amount itself can be manipulated, right? The amount man can be manipulated. So it's the same thing. So the law didn't specify. So this is the loophole, okay? This is the loophole that the law created. So if somebody has profit before interest and tax of let's say 100,000, right? And he goes for a 2 million loan, okay? 2 million loan at 10%. That means that obviously for 30 years, let's see, this is absurd, but let's see, 2 million loan at 10% for 30 years, right? Now, every year, that means assuming profit is constant, which is not possible anyway, but that means every year we are going to deduct 200,000 and result in a tax loss of 100,000 carried forward every year. You see the loophole this person has exploited? Yes, because that is what we call tax avoidance, exploiting loopholes by creating what? artificial transactions. I hope it makes sense. I hope this makes sense. So that is what we mean by what? Tax avoidance. There are a lot of provisions, right? So that is what we mean by tax avoidance, okay? So let's come to tax evasion. When we talk about tax evasion, tax evasion is simply what? Using what? Dubious means. You are just using dubious means. I get it. Which, which means that they are illegal, right? Illegal means to what? avoid taxes, or let me use the word escape, right? Escape taxes. So with tax avoidance, the person is going to use illegal ways or dubious means to what? Escape taxes. So most of the time, when these things happen, whether tax avoidance or tax evasion, it leads to what we call taxpayer risks, okay? It leads to what we call taxpayer risks. Why taxpayer risk? I want to talk about it in terms of tax what? Avoidance, a tax evasion. So what happens is that most of the time, when you you get it, when you look at every taxpayer, every taxpayer is supposed to do some things, right? Register with the tax authority, that is GRE. Make sure you file your taxes appropriately, declare, okay, and pay your taxes, right? So any mistake with these things means that the taxpayer is hiding something or doing something wrong. So when you fail to register, let's say register with the authority to register for VAT or an appropriate type of tax, 
that means you are you have a registration risk, right? That means you have a registration risk or you are being wrongly registered. Two, if you fail to file or file at the appropriate date, you have a filing risk. Also, we could say if you under declare, which is the most common risk, right? That people usually face under declaration of income. And finally, payment risk, not paying at all, right? Or not paying the right amount. So anytime this goes wrong, we could say that there's a, there's a hint of tax avoidance and evasion going on in the taxpayer system, either probably because he didn't have a proper record system or he's finding a way to dupe the tax authorities. Do you get the idea? So we have looked at tax avoidance and tax evasion, basically. But why would some, why would people avoid or evade taxes? And there are many reasons, and this is a possible question they can ask you. Why, why are you going to what, evade or avoid tax? So if you are going to evade tax, maybe you are not well educated. That's one of the reasons too. People feel that the government is not accountable, like they are not using their monies they are paying, right? To do what they want, to do development and stuff. People have been saying it in Ghana. If that's the real case, why should I go and pay when some minister is using my money to do what he wants? This is one of the reasons why somebody does not feel the need to pay taxes, right? Two, I told you lack of education about our tax systems is also two. Three, people feel our tax systems are complex. And because of the complexity of our tax systems, people will definitely uh, what, not pay taxes. Another area is where the people find themselves. Sometimes it's inconvenient to pay the tax, right? Which I think gradually we are trying to bridge that gap. Also, you have multiplicity of taxes. Sometimes some taxes, one income alone, can have so many taxes on it. Let's say I make a sale. This same sale will go into corporate income tax. This same sale, I have to withhold, withholding tax on it. This same sale that I made, right? I have to also what, apply VAT on it. This same sale that I made, if it is an exercisable commodity, I have to apply excise duty on it. Because of these things, people tend to either avoid or evade taxes. I hope that makes sense. You can actually talk. You can talk. Though we are streaming on YouTube, I want it to be interactive. I hope that is okay. I hope that is okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So that was it. Now, let's look at... They can ask you the differences between tax avoidance and tax evasion, but I want to look at tax avoidance and tax evasion schemes, okay? What schemes do you propose that we could say is tax avoidance or tax evasion? Please, because we are streaming, eh, please, you're, you should mute. If you have a question, you can kindly put up your hand because a lot of people are watching from other places too. By your background, some people's backgrounds, there'll be noise and stuff like that. It doesn't speak well of us. I hope that is okay. Let's mute. If you have a question, put up your hand and then I'll be ready to answer you. Okay, so what they can ask you, mostly ICA can ask you, is tax avoidance schemes and tax evasion schemes. So tax avoidance schemes are schemes that people use to exploit loopholes in the tax law. And common ones that we have is um, indirect payments, okay? Indirect payments under the law. What does this mean? I'll give you a typical example. In our law, there are some provisions that allow people to enjoy minimum dividends, right? Uh, or dividend exemption. Let's say section 59, subsection 3, okay? So if this is a resident company A, and he acquires at least 25% of the shares, 25 or more of the shares in B, right? These taxes, uh, when, this, when B pays dividend, the dividend is exempt from tax, right? So this is a guy who is receiving the dividend. But there may be somebody who may not be a resident, let's say a U.S. company here, who wants to enjoy these same benefits. So what happens? This guy will intentionally go and acquire 100% of A, meaning A becomes something like a special purpose vehicle. In actual sense, a special purpose vehicle is an entity we set up, right, to receive payments on our behalf or use to work, enjoy some tax cash flow, right? So in actual sense, when you look at the legal form of it, it possesses the share certificate of the shares in B. He is described as the payee in the law, right? But the actual payee is what? This company. Do you get it? So it means that this guy is using indirect payments so that he does not disclose, so that he conceals or hides the true nature of the transaction. 
So this is exploiting a loophole so that in actual sense, people see that, oh, A has just acquired, let's say, 30% of the shares in B is enjoying the dividend. But the actual dividend goes to the U.S. company, who is not a resident in our county. So that is indirect payment. And every, in simple terms, anti-avoidance scheme, so I'll do it that way. When I teach you the scheme, then I'll teach you the anti-avoidance for it because we do not have time, right? So these indirect payments that we are seeing, right? We are saying that, okay, you doing this indirect payment, the commissioner also must what? Stop you. So anti uh, tax avoidance, tax avoidance, as I was telling you, it's not illegal, it's legal. And because it's legal, that means nobody has what? Jurisdiction over it. That is why the law gives us some provisions to stop people from doing these things. Okay, so if you do this scheme, then the commissioner or those who design the tax law have put provisions inside to, so far as they've been able to identify that specific scheme, they should have something to stop it. So when we go to section 27, okay, section 27 stops this. The commissioner puts in what? Provisions to stop this from happening. And section 27 talks about indirect payments, right? So the commissioner will be able to what? When in his opinion, when he thinks, he sees that the US company who is actually the receiving party or the beneficial owner, he is going to disregard any transaction between A and B and treat the U.S. company as the actual payee of the transaction. And therefore, tax the U.S. company because once you're a U.S. company, you, you are receiving dividends from B. It's between a foreigner and B, meaning that he, he's not going to what, enjoy any dividend exemption. So he'll be taxed on his dividends. So that's the first one. Then the second one I want to talk about is the issue of transfer pricing manipulation. Okay, these are tax avoidance schemes, transfer pricing manipulation. When we talk about transfer pricing, transfer pricing is just the process of what? Determining a price, right? To apply on goods, properties, and services that are transferred between persons in control relationship or simply associated enterprises or related parties. So related parties in our law as per section 128 could be what? Relatives, okay? So far as we, we abide by what we see, right? Let's say you are able to act on my request. So relatives, co companies and their subsidiaries and what associates, okay? So it says that when you own at least 25% of a company, you become persons in controlled relationship. So partners in a partnership, they are all persons in controlled relationship. And you are looking at what? A trust relationship. So a trust, a settler and a beneficiary, okay? You are looking at what? A principal and an agent. If you act on the request of somebody, okay, you become related parties and also a permanent establishment and the head office or the headquarters, right? All these things under section 128 are deemed as persons in what controlled relationship. So anytime you you, you deal in transactions between these people, there's a chance that there'll be bias. Okay. So the law itself under section one. Section 26 tells us that what? We should quantify things in accordance with what? Market value. To accord with what? Market value. What it, what it means is that anything we are doing, we must use what an independent party is going to what? Charge, right? And section 31 is what brings it to light. It says that what? Anytime you are dealing with these people who are persons in controlled relationship, right? You are supposed to use what? The arm's length standard or the arm's length principle, right? And this arm's length standard says that anytime you are dealing with transactions between these people, these relatives and partners and company subsidiaries and parents and group people, you should always use the arm's length standard, right? Arm's length says that what? Treat the transaction as though you do not know me. Treat it as though we do not know each other. What an independent party will use, right? Now, people do not do that. Most of the time, why do they do that? They manipulate these prices to do a lot of things. Most of the time, people manipulate these prices to achieve a specific objective. Either to what? The first one is to minimize what? Tax liability, right? So people do this to minimize tax liability. So they can ask you the objectives of tra transfer pricing, right? So people do this to minimize tax liability. People also manipulate those prices, I get them, to bypass custom controls, okay? So they bypass customs or for customs what? valuation, right? So customs valuation also is a type of transfer price which people do not know because the customs valuation has what? The value of the transaction value is like a transfer price. 
it has price of identical commodity, price of similar commodity, fallback value, deductive value, computed value by the World Trade Organization and in Ghana to reuse it. So it's a type of transfer price. So people manipulate this to actually what? If you bought up online before or you, you import goods from a different country, sometimes you will see that the price that they gave you, the duty is higher than that because they use a new value. Yes, because they are doing transfer price and adjustment. Okay, so these things are done. Why does somebody do transfer price? Either to minimize tax liabilities, bypass cost of valuation. Sometimes because of government policies, right? They want to overcome government policies, such as restrictions. Some countries, eh, when you go and you want to repatriate funds, okay, you cannot, re you cannot repatriate all. And what they do is that because you cannot repatriate all, some people convert or they hide those funds in things like dividend, royalties, management fees, management and technical service expenses, and other, you know, other uh, specified payments, right? Which are all examples of transfer price. So sometimes to smoothen global tax liabilities, okay? So some people do transfer prices just to smoothen what? Global liabilities because they are group, right? So there are a lot of reasons why people go into transfer pricing, but these are the objectives, the main objectives that people want to achieve in transfer pricing, which they can ask you. So people manipulate transfer prices all the time, right? And the law must put in provisions to help us deal with transfer pricing. So if I want to look at the particular provisions in our law that deal with transfer pricing, right? I could start by talking about what, as I told you, section 26, quantification according to market value. Section 31 is the main section that deals with it because this one even comes with an LI, which we focus on in Ghana, LI 2412, right? So the, the minister can make a legislative instrument, which is the transfer pricing regulations. And this is the main document we use in Ghana together. This one goes in line with the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, right? That is what it was framed based on, more than techniques. Then we could look at section 128 that talks about what um, transfer pricing, um, persons in control relationship. So when you are dealing with transfer pricing in Ghana, these are your basic ones. Though there are other parts of the law, the VAT Act has a bit of associated entities, customs has it, but I am talking about income tax because that's your jurisdiction in exam. So these are the sections that have anti-avoidance provisions, like they stop you from particularly um, manipulating taxes, right? So that's the second tax, that's the second tax word, avoidance word, scheme. Now, the third the third one we can talk about is something we call income splitting, right? Something we call income splitting. Now, when we talk about income splitting, income splitting is where what? You can either split your income with another person. So from we can look at it from an individual's perspective or from a corporate perspective. From an individual's perspective, we mean that you are splitting your income, right, with associated entities, right, or associated parties or related parties to actually minimize your tax liability, okay, to minimize your taxes. That is income splitting. So if you have, let's say, 200,000 Ghana cities, or let's say 600,000 as your annual income, then you know that 600,000 means I'll be taxed at 35%. So what I'll do is that I'll create a simple uh, sole proprietor and employ my wife, my children, and split the money amongst them so that, you know, because we are on graduated rate, I would, let's say, take... 150,000, meaning that I will not fall in the 35% bracket again because it's graduated. And because I've split the money in small quantities, all of them will not get to the 35%. I get to, when I finish and I combine everything together, you will realize that the, you realize that the, the combination of all the individual taxes will not be up to that 35% of my original 600,000. That is income splitting too. From the corporate perspective, income splitting will be things like what? Transferring income from what? A low tax or transferring expenses from a low tax jurisdiction, okay, to a high tax jurisdiction. This is an income shifting strategy, okay? High tax jurisdiction. And how? what does this mean? It means that if I know that I'm selling goods to you, right, okay, in my books, it will be sales. But let's say I'm in Mauritius and I'm paying 2% tax, okay? 
you are in Ghana. So if I transfer these goods to you, to you it's going to be an expense where you are paying 25% tax, right? So this expense will reduce your income and therefore reduce your taxes you are paying. This is a typical example of income split. And another one is that um, manufacturing companies in Ghana, for instance, get some incentives, right? And that incentive includes locational incentives. So let's say I'm located in some village somewhere. I'm going to pay 12.5%. You are in Accra. We are group companies, all in manufacturing. I can intentionally transfer some machine to you. When I transfer the machine to you, what happens? You get capital allowance. And that capital allowance will further reduce your income. So me that I'm already in um, the place I'm paying 12.5, I'll transfer machine to you. And that machine, remember, you are going to charge capital allowance, which is going to reduce your tax in Tema or Accra where you are paying 25%. That is income split. I hope it makes sense. These things are very practical, not just book. We use it in real life. In, in international practice, we use income splitting in real life. And there are so many techniques around income splitting that people do not even look at. There's even income splitting around residence of taxes. People do not even know them. But for your exam sake, you just know as you get more into practice, you are going to get more of it. So that was income splitting. I hope you got it. Now, the next type of um, anti-avoidance provision or tax avoidance provision, which I want to talk about, is thin capitalization, right? Thin capitalization why i don't even know why they call it thing capitalization well capitalization is simply your market value of equity okay capitalization is simply your market value of equity so if we say this is thing remember every capital structure has two things market value of equity and market value of debt right so if you are saying that your equity market value of equity is thing right thing capitalization then it means market value of equity is fat right if this one is thing that means this is fat and in accounting or finance it means that the one which is fat is what they are taking advantage of. So debt being fat in your account, we call it what high gearing, right? High gearing. And this is the main thing that is done to take advantage of interest in the law. Remember, I told you section 10 says, so price you borrow money and use it to buy an asset or use it to fund your business, right? Which is working capital and also. Then the interest can be deducted. So what people do is that what? They become highly geared by borrowing from friends and family or from related parties, right? So that they can take advantage of interest. And even to some extent, foreign currency losses, they intentionally borrow in foreign loans so that one, they can deduct interest and two, deduct foreign currency losses, right? And this is it. Being highly geared means your market value of equity is thing. That's why we use thing capitalization, right? Your capitalization is thing, meaning your debt is fat or your long-term loans are more meaning you are highly geared. So high gearing or high leverage is thin capitalization, right? And the law has some rules under section what? The law has some rules under section 33 to deal with this, right? Kindly check this out, right? So we, we are going to talk about this. We are going to talk about this actually. Then the, the fifth one, which I would want to talk about are... Uh, Transactions that you may not know, but any other transaction that uh, may be way, but we can look at reinvestment, right? Reinvestment of proceeds into your business. Okay, so some people do it to take advantage of ways, so realization, right? In the past, we used to call it rollover relief, but there are some rules around realization, right? Some people can intentionally sell companies and will not change. So there are a lot of them, but these are common ones. We can even have changes in our accounting date where somebody will intentionally change his accounting year or his accounting date just to what? Exploit revenue gaps. So section 18 deals with this, right? Section 18 deals with this. I think section 46 also deals with this, right? And even the LIA amendment number two at 924 also deals with this. Okay, so there are a lot of provisions in our law, but basically if they ask you for tax avoidance schemes, you should be able to explain them. That the second thing is tax evasion schemes, right? When it comes to tax evasion schemes, there are a lot of them, right? But tax evasion schemes are things that are illegal. So not registering with the tax authority or staying out of the tax system is something that is bad. Not paying taxes, okay? People do not pay taxes. Under declarations, okay? Under declarations, 
um, assaulting tax officers or false or misleading statement, right? So when you give false or misleading statement, non-compliance, okay, non-compliance, it's all tax evasion. People keeping two sets of books. Some people can keep two sets of books, okay? Um, only working in cash, okay? Doing an extra job for cash. Because if I sell or buy in cash only, if the other part is not recorded, how would I know I carried out the service, right? All these things are some some of them aiding and abetting, okay? You can even talk about what? Assault of tax officers, not so. False and misleading statement. And claiming false expenses, I get to them. All these things are tax evasion schemes. You are doing illegal things under the law, right? So these are tax avoidance and tax evasion schemes. Okay, now that we know these things, we are now going to look at what? Constraints to effective tax planning, okay? Constraints to effective tax planning. Now, if somebody is not effectively planning his taxes, why? That means there are some things that are stopping you, right? And the things that are stopping you are many things. It could be lack of time. It could be lack of information. It could be lack of resources. It could be because you have you have found yourself in a place that you cannot plan taxes, or there's a limitation on you. There could be a lot of factors, right? But all these factors can basically be grouped into three basic areas, right? The first is one a legal restriction, right? which we call a legal constraint. And these legal constraints are basically what? Your anti-avoidance provisions, right? You are not effectively planning your taxes because there's anti-avoidance, which is stopping you from planning your taxes, right? And these anti-avoidance provisions are the provisions in the law that stop you from properly planning your taxes. So we have what we call general anti-avoidance rules. And in Ghana, we can use section 34 and section 99 of the Revenue Administration, although there are some mixed up in the law, but uh, this is the one that I can talk about. There's even section 135 talking about agreements affecting taxes. Okay, so this is what I say we can look at. Then we have specific anti-avoidance rules. And specific for specific anti-avoidance rules, we can basically look at what? A lot of them. Specific ones like section 31, section 32, section 33. We can look at section 27, section 18, even section 12, section 16. They are all even uh, repairs and improvements is an anti avoidance provision, stopping people from carrying out or deducting repairs, right? In excess of 5%. Limitation on deduction of financial costs is an anti avoidance provision. Section 62, changes in ownership, anti avoidance provision. So all these things are all anti avoidance provisions, right? Which stop people. The second one is what we call the judicial limitations or judicial constraints, right? And when we talk about judicial constraints, the law courts over time have dealt with tax cases and have come with some transactions that reflect economic what, reality. It means that anything you do, if it does not reflect economic reality, the commissioner has the chance or the tax authorities have the chance to, what, to reverse that transaction, right? So there are two major ones, okay? There's something we call the business doctrine, okay? Which says that any transaction that you are doing, Make sure that you do it to what? reflect business purpose. So if you are doing it and in the opinion of the commissioner, he thinks that transaction does not reflect business but was purposely done, okay, meaning it was fictitious. It was just created as an artificial transaction to take advantage of tax um, evasion or take advantage of loopholes. He may disregard or completely ignore that transaction or recharacterize it, right? Then we have something we call substance over form, meaning that we are looking at what? your commercial substance over the legal form. So in the example we looked at earlier, the US company was buying what shares in what? The Ghanaian company. So in substance, who is enjoying is the US company, but who in legal form, who has the title document is the company A, right? So we are looking at the substance. If the commissioner sees that the substance differs from what the legal uh, ownership, he can recharacterize or change the nature of the transaction. So we have what we call substance over form. And this substance over form has some sub constraints under them. We have something we call a step transaction doctrine, which says that, okay, the transaction that you are doing, if it is in a lot of steps, that, that hides the true ownership or hides the true beneficial owner. The commissioner general shall cancel all the steps and deal with you directly. We have something we call sham transaction doctrine. So your transactions that you are dealing with, are they real or they are not, right? 
So this is it. So sometimes they separate this step transaction into a separate constraint, making them three. But they are a lot. We have the doctrine of label. Sometimes you can label transactions to not make them look real, right? Meaning that you have recharacterized them in a way that people will not see the true ownership, right? So these are the judicial constraints. Then the last one is uncertainty, right? People purposely cannot plan taxes well because of uncertainty. Why uncertainty? See, we did not know that the reliefs are going to change it. We, we didn't, right? So you can plan. And for instance, COVID. COVID came, you planned, and all your plans got shattered, right? So that is an example of what? That is an example of uncertainty, right? It can stop you from properly planning your tax, right? For instance, if you change some particular amendment right now, you would have planned around it, and the amendment would have spoiled everything. So now let's go into the anti-avoidance provisions. I wouldn't waste so much time on anti-avoidance provisions. So for anti-avoidance provisions, we are going to deal with what I told you there are two. We are first going to look at the general anti-avoidance rules, and then we are going to look at the specific anti-avoidance rules. So first of all, let's start with the general anti-avoidance rules. So we are going to visit, where is my income tax act? We are going to visit section 34 of the income tax act quickly. Looking for my income tax act. Please hold on for me while I wait for my income tax act. I prefer to use the act directly than a text book. Okay. Revenue Administration Act. So, first of all, let's go to section 34 of the Income Tax Act and let's look at what it says there under general anti avoidance. Section 34. Is my screen visible? Oh, my screen is visible. Okay. So general anti-avoidance rule. For the purpose of determining a tax liability under this act, the Commissioner General may recharacterize. So the word there is what? Recharacterize. Recharacterization means what? Change the nature of the transaction. So maybe the transaction may be debt. He can change it to be equity. Or ignore it. Disregard it completely. If he thinks that that transaction is entered into or is carried out as part of a tax avoidance scheme, what does the Commissioner thing is tax avoidance under this section. He says what? Tax avoidance includes any arrangement which has the main purpose of which is to what? Or the main purpose of which is to reduce or what? Avoid tax liability. So if the commissioner thinks that the transaction you are doing is in this aspect, then he has two actions. Means the actions that I'm concerned about. So section 34 is saying that what are the actions of the commissioner around this? He's saying that the actions is that what? He may add that what? One, recharacterize that transaction that's changing the nature, right? Or to disregard it, right? So these are the rules that the commissioner has around it. These are the strategies he uses to stop people, right? If only he thinks that transaction is what? Fictitious. The transaction is not real, right? Meaning it does not reflect business purpose or does not have a substantial economic effect. You see the judicial doctrines have come here. And its form does not reflect its substance. Substance over form, you can see. So the judicial constraints we saw here are what we use in general anti-avoidance because here the transaction is not specific. It is any transaction at all. But so far as in the opinion of the commissioner, he thinks that it is fictitious. It does not reflect substance over form. I get it. It may be a label transaction. It may be what a, a step transaction. He may disregard it or recharacterize it. So that is it. Now, let's go to section 99 of the Revenue Administration Act. And let's see what it says there too. So section 99 deals with tax avoidance what, arrangement. Now, when we talk about tax avoidance arrangement, section 99 also makes it clear. Okay, this one, we mostly use it to deal with international transactions, but it can also be applied to domestic transactions, right? So despite any provision in the tax law, where the commercial general is of the opinion that the person... Otherwise secure, might otherwise secure a tax benefit under a tax avoidance arrangement. The commission may adjust the tax liability of the person in a way that he considers appropriate to counteract 
in simple terms, reverse the tax benefit you enjoy. I get it. So if the commissioner, in his opinion, thinks that what you are doing is not real, it's fictitious, or it does not have substance over form, right? The commissioner may what? Adjust your tax liability to counteract that benefit. And how does he do it? He will save you with a notice of assessment. And in your notice of assessment, which is the notice carrying your tax liability, he will specify the tax benefit you got, the arrangement you entered into, and the adjustment that he made, right? So that is it. So he can serve you a separate notice or that notice may be part of your actual tax liability, right? And here he's saying that if you hear tax avoidance arrangement, it's any arrangement that has a main purpose to provide you a tax benefit, okay? Or an arrangement where the benefits that might be expected to accrue from it is a tax benefit for you. And he says that if we talk about a tax benefit here, we mean that it's a what? You are either avoiding reducing or postponing a tax liability, you are increasing your claim for a refund of tax, or you are preventing or obstructing the collecting of tax. He deems it as what? Tax avoidance here. I get it, a tax benefit for you. So it says what? An arrangement will constitute a tax avoidance arrangement under this section if only it involves a misuse or abuse of a tax law provision. Having regard to the purpose of the provision and the wider purposes of the law in which the provision is situated. Now, this, um, what do we call it? This uh, provision was basically brought because the DTAs are read together with the domestic tax law. It was brought because of something called treaty shopping or treaty abuse. In Ghana, we do not have BEPS provisions in our law. When we talk about BEPS, we call it base erosion and profit shifting. There are rules that subsequently they want to bring in, but these provisions help deal with such international transactions. When somebody is not part of a treaty, just like the US company example, but wants to be a part of what, a, a provision that Ghana companies are enjoying their DTAs, you can intentionally buy a Ghana company so that you can enjoy those provisions in there. DT of the Ghanaian campaign, right? So with that being said, I think that is it. Now, we come to the special anti-avoidance provisions, okay? There are a lot of them. So the first one I'll talk about is what? Changes in accounting date. Changes in accounting date. Well, this is not common, but you have to know it because it's an anti-avoidance provision. So with changes in accounting date or changes in accounting year, we make reference to section eight. And we are saying that, okay, this one only applies to trusts and companies. And we are saying that, okay, if you're a company or a trust, who wants to change your accounting date, you must apply to the commissioner general. And that is the provision itself. And the commissioner general is going to give you what? Some, the commissioner general is going to give you some uh, conditions to follow. If you do not follow those conditions, then it means that you are what? You are not going to get it, right? I hope you are all following. So we are saying that, yes, the Commissioner General may, on application, grant you a change in accounting date, right? So we can see. So we are saying that what? He may, on application by a trust or a company, approve a change of accounting year of the trust or company on the terms and conditions that he may approve. So the Commissioner may approve, may revoke an approval that he granted you if you fail to apply and comply with the conditions. So this alone is an anti-avoidance provision stopping people from complying, right? So what are the conditions? Remember, I told you this only applies to trusts and companies. For individuals like partnerships and sole proprietors, they do not have any accounting here. They use the calendar year. So what are the conditions? You must first apply to the commissioner in writing before the change. You must specify in the application how you intend to deal with the transitional period between the old accounting and the new accounting year. Okay, so if maybe my old accounting year ended in December and now I want to change in June, there's a difference, I get it, there's a time gap. That time gap, how do you intend to deal with all revenues and losses that happen there, right? If you were supposed to file taxes, how do you deal with it there? And why do you want to change accounting year? You must look at the reason, right? You should have filed all relevant returns up to the old dates and the new accounting date to avoid any revenue gaps. And you should have settled all your taxes, interest or penalties due I get to all you should have made a satisfactory arrangement with the commissioner general. All directors of the trust or company should have filed and paid all their relevant taxes to. So this alone will stop people because directors may have not paid their taxes. You still have taxes you have to pay, right? Which you are owing, which you are not intending to pay now. So this alone is going to stop you from what? You know, going for this. So that's anti-avoidance provision. 
when it comes to changes in ownership, right? So the next thing I want to talk about is transfer pricing manipulations and how the law stops them. So section 33 deals with this, right? And section 33 particularly tells us that what? When you are dealing with arms length standard between associates, as of now, everybody here knows who an associate is. I taught you who associates are. So we are saying that what? When an arrangement exists between persons who are in controlled relationship, relatives, groups, also partners, trusts and trustees and beneficiaries, um, agents and their principals, uh, permanent establishments and their head office or branch and their head office, they are all related parties. Now, you shall calculate your income and tax payable according to the arm's length standard. So the arm's length standard is simply a standard that requires persons who are associated to quantify, characterize, and apportion and allocate all their transactions. Are you getting it? To reflect an arrangement that will be dealt with between independent parties. So we are saying that, okay, any arrangement that is dealt with between independent parties is simply arm's length. Arm's length because... You don't know me, I don't know you. Fair market value, open market value, right? You don't know me, I don't know you. This is to avoid bias. Now, why the arm's length principle? ICA can ask you the benefits, okay? The benefits and disadvantages of the arm's length principle or the arm's length standard. One, it is used on a majority of cases globally, right? So majority adopts it globally. That's one of the benefits too. It brings standardization in transactions because we are all applying what arm's length values. It encourages international trade, right? Encourages international what, trade. Brings both what? Brings both related and independent parties, okay? Related and independent parties to an equal footing, right? To an equal what? Footing. makes accounting or tax administration easier, right? Because it's easy to apply, right? Now, the disadvantage is that sometimes it's difficult to find comparables because the arms and principle depends purely on comparability, right? So it is difficult to what? apply comparables. And sometimes there may be some cost disadvantages because sometimes instead of getting group synergies, in the arm's length principle, you have to split all your group companies into individual separate companies to be accounted for tax. I, I get it, which may bring some cost disadvantage. So sometimes too, you can also talk about what related parties dealing in what transactions which unrelated parties can deal in. This may make it difficult to what apply the arm's length what principle. So they can ask you. The benefits or disadvantages of the arms principle, which I've told you, right? Encouraging international trade standardization. It is used in major cases globally. And there are, these are some of the things that you have to look out for, right? Now, what I want to talk about under section 31, which is the arms length and uh, the arms length adjustment or transfer pricing adjustment, is under uh, subsection four. It says what? When the opinion of the commissioner, he thinks that you have failed to com uh, to to commit or comply with the arms length principle. He may adjust your income to reflect the arms length principle. So that is it. So if I sell goods to you, that's transfer pricing adjustment, right? If I sold goods to you at what fifty thousand cities, right? And the, in the opinion of the commissioner, he does his research. He sees that these goods were sold for thirty thousand. Then the commissioner shall pass back what. 20,000 adjustment back to your profit, right? So this is a transfer pricing or an arms length adjustment. And in most of your questions that you are going to solve, I mean computation of tax liability, such notes are in there. So open your eyes to check this out. I hope that is okay. So remember, so these things are basically transfer pricing issues and the minister makes regulations, you see under section 31, to deal with this arms length standard. So the transfer pricing regulations deal with a lot of things that you have to know. But first of all, what I want to talk about is what? The comparability factors. So the comparability factors are simply what? Factors that you must be able to what? Apply to say two transactions are comparable. So what is comparability? We say two transactions are comparable if one, there are no significant differences between them, or two, even if there are differences, the differences are too small that they are not going to affect the transfer prices choosing. 
okay, or the indicator, the financial indicator that we are going to use to determine the transfer price, okay, that is it. That is comparability. Either there are no differences, or even if there are differences, reasonably accurate adjustments can be done to eradicate those differences. They can ask you what comparability is. So look at it first. Either there are no differences between them, or even if there are differences, they are too small that we can make reasonably I get an accurate adjustment to eradicate those differences. So that is comparability. Now, before we can say we can apply the arm's length principle, the two things we are comparing must be comparable. And what are the factors of comparability? So there are five factors of comparability. I get it. That can what tell us that two, two factors or two things are comparable. Let's say I sell bikes, right? Or let me make it cars. Let's say I sell cars, right? And I'm deciding to sell car. I am A. So let's say this is me, A, A1. I'm selling to my brother, who is A2, right? I'm selling a car to my brother at what? Let's say um, 200,000 Ghana cities. I'm selling to my brother, right? Now, somebody also sells a similar car. Let's say my car is also like Range Rover, right? And Range Rover is an independent party, remember? He's also selling the same similar car, but he is selling his at, let's say, um, 500,000 Ghana cities, okay? The commissioner is saying, ah, why are you not also selling your car at this 500? We cannot sell our car at 500 because there may be some factors we may be different. And the first factor of comparability, to ensure there's comparability, one, we have to look at what? The characteristics of the product or service, right? So the characteristics of the product or service. So first of all, have we looked at the physical features of this product or service? Have you looked at the quantity I'm supplying? Have you looked at the nature of the intangibles in there? So you cannot say we should compare. Maybe this one has a lot of capacity. Engine capacity can run more than mine. That's why it's 500, mine is 200. We cannot sell it at the same price too. You have to look at what? The relative importance of your functions, risk and assets. So we call it a functional analysis. And this functional analysis, what we are saying is that, okay, maybe the functions I carry, okay, differs from what that guy is doing and the assets I used to work, perform those functions may have differed from his and maybe I carry out a lower risk than him because if he carries out a higher risk, then he has, he's supposed to get a higher return. Remember, the higher the risk, the higher the return. So if Range Rover has some specific or unique intangible, right? Unique asset or unique intangible asset, remember, that alone can make him increase the price because he has to compensate for the loss is incurring or the higher risk he's facing, right? So the one who faces the higher risk definitely will charge a higher return. So this may be the reason why his taxes are more than this guy. So if you go and they ask you for a functional analysis, which is still possible, all you have to do is put it in a tabular form. So let's say I'm comparing to what Range Rover. So this is A1, this A2, and this is the independent party being Range Rover, right? So in exam, you use a tabular form just like this. So you talk about what your functions, so this guy does manufacturing of the car and what design of the car specifications. Let's say my brother is only a distributor. So he does sales and distribution. Then the Range Rover also does manufacturing and design. So you can see that Range Rover is more what? Its functions are more similar to A1, meaning A1 becomes what we call the tested party. Okay, so the tested party is the party who is more um, relatable or more close to what the independent party is doing and is the least complex party to the transaction. So if you take your asset, you can say that this guy manufacturing, definitely you need some PPE, you need some human workers, not so you need some intangibles or some brand, you need some machines and other things, right? The same applies to them. Then when you come to risk, look at the risk this guy is going to take. You can even suggest some market risks, right? If it's a new party, there may be credit risk. Nobody will give him money. You can look at if it's important, foreign exchange risk, if it has to do with cars, it can easily go out of fashion, right? Inventory of solicence risk. There may be political risk for you to bring it in Ghana. All these things, you have to think about them. So in exam, you just suggest, right? Some may be in the case, some may not be there. You just suggest, use a tabular for functions, assets, and risk, and do for all of them, and you get your full mark. Mostly, it's between 10 to 20 marks. It can come from there. So once you look at the relative functions, assets, and risk, the next thing is what? The contractual terms. If two transactions are going to be what? Um, similar. Then it depends on the contract terms. Are they the same? If the contracts are different, the volume supply, the prices, all those things can influence the price. This can also be termed as the basic information you need to come up with a transfer price or 
you can also look at the factors that influence the setting of a price or the application of the arm's length standard, right? These are all factors you consider. Because the terms and conditions of your transaction may be different from mine. That's why yours is 500 and mine is what, 200. Also, you can also talk about what? The economic circumstances or market conditions. Maybe you are located in a good part of Ghana where people are rich, but me, I'm in the suburbs, okay? I'm in an area where somebody cannot afford 500,000. So I decide to sell it at what? 200,000. So the economic conditions or market conditions are important, right? The geographical area itself or the market I'm in, right? The industry also counts. Then finally, the business strategy. Maybe because this is my first time, right? I want to go with market penetration and sell low. You are already in the business, you're a price differentiator. You That is your strategy. So you are selling at a high price. I don't think all people have the same strategy. So if the commissioner says you should apply, these are the things you tell him. That one, the characteristics are different, our functions and risk and assets are different. The contractual terms were different. The economic conditions were different. And our strategies were different. So we cannot sell at the same price, right? This is the reason why these things are what are different. So look at this question here, which has come before that. It says what? Two vehicles were sold by Excel Vehicles Limited to two different buyers at the following prices. So the first buyer bought it at an equivalent of 65,000 and the second at 70,000. And this arrangement, the tax authority finds difficult to accept and plans to confront Excel Vehicles on the matter. You can see. The commissioner has invited you as an ICA finalist to advise him on the factors to consider before approaching Excel Vehicles Limited on the matter as the commissioner general suspect related party issue. Okay, so what are you going to call, uh, talk to the commissioner before approaching the vehicle dealer? So you see two vehicles, different prices. Transfer pricing is happening. So you are going to talk about these five factors, right? That because they are different, maybe the characteristics were different, the function, the contractual terms, economic conditions or business strategies, were different. And that is why these transactions are different, right? So that is it. So remember this. Okay. So now we come to transfer pricing methods, which students do not usually understand. Now, before you, you use a transfer pricing method, you have to consider some things. And the law tells you that, okay, consider the relative strengths of the method and the weaknesses. Consider whether the method is applicable in that circumstance. Consider the transaction at hand and consider the tested party involved. So when we are looking at all these things, we are saying that before you determine a transfer price, there's something we call what? Profit level indicator or the financial indicator. Or simply, anytime you are applying a transfer price, eh, it's price or other conditions. And this thing, if you want to determine a transfer price, it's either your price is different from somebody's price, your markup is different from somebody's markup, or your margin is different from somebody's margin, right? So in simple terms, everybody here knows that markup is a percentage of cost. So markup is simply what? your profit over some cost times 100%, right? And when we talk about margin, you are accountant, so you understand what I mean. The margin is just what? Profit over what? Selling price, right? Or sales times what? 100, okay? So it's either your markup differs from what? Independent person's markup on the market or your margin differs from what? Independent person's mark, uh, margin or your price differs from them, right? So it's three things that may define a transfer pricing scenario. So there are five methods of transfer pricing and these ones can be further grouped into a traditional and what? Transactional profit method. So the first one I want to talk about is the cap method. So the cap method is that simple. The commissioner is saying that, okay, the price that I want to sell my car to my brother, remember A1, I'm selling to what? A2, right? Okay, then we have an independent party here who sells Let's say this was the company he sells to any other third party at 500,000, right? So I sold, I sold to my brother at what 200,000. So the commissioner is saying that I shouldn't use this price, but the price that I should use if I'm applying cap method is to look at one, an internal comparable. An internal comparable means that what would I, A1, sell to a third party or an independent party? If I can sell this car to an independent party at 400,000, then why am I selling to my brother at 200? Meaning that I should apply this price rather because this one, there's no bias because I don't know that person, right? So this one we call an internal cap. Or I can use the price with two independent parties who sell between themselves, which is an external work, comparable, like I see here, right? So the commissioner will allow me to either use the 500,000 or 400,000, meaning a sensible transfer pricing range of prices will be something between what? 400 
to 500, meaning that this 200 I've used is wrong. The commissioner can pass an adjustment. If I use 400, then adjustment between what 200 and 400, making 200 to back to my profit, or the commissioner may pass what an adjustment of 300,000 back to my profit. So that is a cap method. Comparable and controlled price method. Okay. So comparable, the name itself explains the method. Comparable and controlled price. The price is not controlled, right? We are using an uncontrolled price between unrelated parties, right? So that is the cap method. And the cap method is the best transfer pricing method in the world. So far as, so far as there are comparable. If there's no comparable, then the transfer pricing uh, cap method is not relevant. It's not reliable. It is the best method which is applied together with any other method you can consider. If only they are comparables. If there are no comparables, you cannot use cap. So in what circumstances can you mostly think about cap? Let's say the pricing of what financial transactions, okay? So for instance, if I want a loan, if I go to the bank, it's easy for me to get other banks to compare to, right? And determine the price of the loan or the interest I have to pay. Also intangibles, right? The pricing of intangibles like royalties and other things, it is possible for you to get it on the market. Right? Normal sale or purchase of goods and services, mostly guys, they use cap. So that's cap method. Now, let's look at cost plus method, which is the second method I want to talk about. So cost plus is just what? Taking the direct and indirect costs of your related party and adding an arm's length markup, okay? An arm's length markup, gross profit markup to it to arrive at the transfer price. So it is simply cost plus profit equals selling price, right? Which is the transfer price. This is why we know from accounting. So we are saying, that, okay, if I look at my cost, both direct and indirect cost, and I apply my markup to get the price at which I should sell to my brother, right? The car. It may be that my profit may differ from what independent parties are charging. So remember that I sold my car. Remember that I sold my car, right, to my brother at 200000 right? Maybe I incurred cost, okay? I incurred cost, both direct and indirect cost for what? I incurred cost, both direct and indirect for, let's see, hundred and what, 80000 nothing. That was my cost. I get it. Meaning, what profit did I make? It means that I made a gross profit of what? 20000 right? So if I want to do my markup, let's say that my markup that I'll get is what? 20 out of 180 times 100. What percentage is it? What percentage would that be? 20 out of 180 times 100. That would be what my markup would be. So let's see, 20 out of 180. So uh -huh, that's about what? 11%, right? So this is what I have charged. But assuming that independent parties on the market charge a markup of what? Let's say 10% or let's say 15%. It means that I have deviated from what independent parties are charging. Meaning that this is what I'll do to get the transfer price, the appropriate transfer price. I must take what? The cost which I've incurred, which is the 180,000. No, so, and apply the arm's length what markup, which independent parties are charging, right? Which is 15%. So the 180,000 times 15% will give me what? 27,000, right? So if I add it, that means I should have sold this vehicle at 207,000, which is the transfer price. But I sold it at 200,000, meaning that if I deduct my 200,000 charge, that means the commissioner general can pass 7,000 back to my property, right? So this is the cost plus method. Okay, so you are looking at what independent parties will charge, what markup independent parties will charge. If it differs from your markup, then you are going to apply what? That independent party markup. Then you find the transfer pricing adjustment, right? Which I just said. So that was it. So the next method I want to talk about is the resale price method. Now, when do we use the cost plus method? Sorry. It can be used in the price of goods and services as well, right? But mostly we are looking at manufactured goods, right? So manufacturing arrangements. So when you have things like manufacturing in a case or contracts manufacturing or um, services, service arrangements, this is the ideal um, transactions that we use the cost plus for. Then the next one I want to talk about is um, the resale price method. Okay, so resale price only happens when we are doing marketing or what? We mostly use it in marketing and distribution functions where we only add no value or little value to the products or services that we are trying to sell, right? And how does this work? 
This method is simple. You remember I was selling the car to my brother, right? How much did I sell the car for? I sold it at 200,000 Ghana cities, right? Now, if I have to sell, resell this to third parties on the market, or I have to sell this to independent parties, right? So let's say I sell to other third parties on the market. So this one, let's say I my brother sold it to me at 200,000, right? I also sold it to third parties on the market for 250,000, right? So this is what happens. I buy and I resell, right? So here, this is the resale price, right? I resell to other parties. After adding nothing to it, or I can add something small to it, a small margin. Now, this one only works when there's little or no value, right? So what happens is that with this one, what we do is that we work back. Remember, we said cost plus profit equals selling price, right? The same way it means that selling price minus what profit must be equal to the cost. So this cost here is the transfer price. We want to see the price. Look. This is the price, right? I bought it from somebody. Here is the cost to me. I bought it from somebody. So we want to see the price at which I should have bought from my brother. So we are working back to get that cost to me, which is the price at which my brother will transfer. So that's the transfer price. So in simple terms here, if I look at it, I know that what my selling price, my resale price, I sold to people at 250,000, right? I bought it from my brother at what? At cost of what? 200, you remember? Meaning that I would have made what? A profit of how much? A profit of 50,000. Now, this 50,000 profit that I've made, what is my margin? Margin is what? My profit over my selling price, right? I have made 50 out of what? 250, right? Just five out of 25. That means I made profit of what? 20%, right? Mar margin of 20%. Now, this margin of 20% that I have done, what has happened? If independent parties charge a margin of what 15% on the market, let's say they charge a margin of 25% on the market, this is the arm's length what margin. It means that I've deviated from what independent parties are doing, meaning I've not complied with the transfer price. So my appropriate transfer price, which is arm's length, is to take the resale price, okay, resale price, and less the arm's length what the arm's length resale margin from it. And arm's length, they are charging 25, not my 20. My 20 is not equal to the 25. So in that case, I can take what? The 250,000 I'm charging people and less the arm's length margin, which is 25% of that same 250,000 to get the price which I should have bought from my brother. So we are saying that 250,000 by that. That means I should have bought from my brother at 187,500, right? That's the appropriate transfer price here. But I bought from my brother at 200, meaning that the commissioner can pass an adjustment of the difference, which is this against the 200,000, 12,500 back to my profit, right? And this one I told you is mostly used in what? Marketing and distribution functions. Now you see the way we got the markup and the margin from the transaction. There's other methods, like what we call the transactional net margin method, TNM. And this one works at the net profit level, not the gross profit level. And this one, it uses what? The net profit or what we call the operating profit, which you know as your profit before interest and tax, right? We use this relative to an appropriate base. And the appropriate base may be this over cost or over assets or over sales or over capital employed, over net asset. It could be anything, right? To determine an appropriate markup or margin to use in a transaction. So if you go and they ask you the transactional net margin method, we use it by comparing what? the net profit to an appropriate base, such as cost, asset, sales, capital employed, whatever, to determine an appropriate markup or margin to use in a transfer pricing what scenario, right? That is the transactional net margin method. And the last method is what we call profit split. So the profit split, what we do is that this one, there are no comparables at all. And because there are no comparables, we find a way to, instead of splitting prices, we split profits, okay? We split profits amongst what? Um, independent, Profit that would have been split between controlled parties like my brother and I will split it using a similar independent party transactions that are on different scales, right? So we just split. So there are two types. We have what we call comparable profit split or contribution analysis, where we split our contributions based on what independent parties would have done. And we have what we call residual profit split, where we split transactions based on what? what I contribute first and any special thing that I contribute. We share a normal contribution when we are done. Any residual profit will be shared to us in the special benefits that we contributed, right? Now, if you do not have benefits or if you are looking at the best transfer pricing method in the world, it is the transactional net margin. 
because this one, comparables are not so much like the cap. So cap, if they are comparables, it is the best. But if no comparables, then this is the best one because this one uses net profit to an appropriate rate. So ICA can ask you, it has come before. I think the very second night they ask. So that, that's all about transfer pricing. I hope it helped. That's a summary of all the methods. Now, we go to thin capitalization, okay? Thin capitalization. So when it comes to thin capitalization, we are saying that what? Spare section 33. Now, this features almost as part of your exam every time. Thin capitalization is dealt with under what? Section 33. Now, section 33, let's go there before we come to income splitting. I'm more concerned about thin cap than income splitting. Now, when a resident entity, which is not a financial institution, so if you are not a financial institution, um, you can be thinly capitalized. Why not a financial institution? Because financial institutions always deal in loans, I get in it, or debt. That's why you shouldn't be a financial institution, meaning you must be a resident exempt entity, okay? And in which what? 50% or more of the underlying ownership or control is held by an exempt person, either alone or together with an associate, as a debt to equity ratio in excess of three is to one at any time during the basis period, right? A deduction is disallowed for any interest paid or foreign currency exchange loss incurred by that entity during the period or on that part of the debt which exceeds three is to one ratio, being a portion of the interest or loss, otherwise deductible but for this subsection. So think capitalization rules are actually two in the income tax act, right? There's one under section what? 31, which we just read, right? Okay. Now, the first one is the what? The arm's length adjustment rule, okay? The first one is arm's length adjustment rule, which is under section 31, subsection five. And then the two is what we have, which is the fixed debt to equity ratio rule, right? but people do not know it like this, which we find it under section 33. Now let's explain. We are saying that, let's say I take a loan from a parent company or from a group or from a relative, right? The law is saying that if that loan's uh, characteristics differs from what the banks will give. Okay, let's say I took a loan for 50%, 50% interest, and then a uh, Bank of Ghana loan is not up to 50% interest. The commissioner shall what? Either disregard the transaction or recharacterize it, right? based on that, to reflect the arm's length loan, which everybody will give. Look here. It says what? Subsection 5 of section 31 says what? The commissioner in carrying out the arm's length adjustment may recharacterize an arrangement made between persons who are in a controlled relationship, including recharacterizing debt financing as equity financing. This is a thing capitalization adjustment. So if the commissioner thinks that the transaction that you are doing does not reflect what independent parties are doing or the banks are doing. He can recharacterize your loan and make it equity. If the characteristics look like equity and the, uh, the, 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 the things that make this are specified in the transfer pricing regulations, right? What circumstances would the commissioner do this? But don't worry about it. If you look at the circumstances, it looks like what the normal banks do, okay? So this is the first part of think up. Now the think up itself, which is a fixed debt to equity ratio rule is saying that, look, if I go and borrow a loan, okay, if I go and borrow a loan, let's take a simple scenario. So this company has a loan, right, from his parent company, from parent, okay, of, let's say, um, $500,000. Let's say it was $500,000, or let's make it $100,000, okay? This guy has a loan of $100,000 from his parent company, okay? And then it was, it was got on 1st January, January 1st, 2023, right? When the interest rate was 10 CDs to $1. And then at 31st December, 2023, right? Interest, uh, the exchange rate was 12 CDs to $1, right? So this is what we have. Are we okay? Then when they said, they are telling us that what? The equity in our law, they say they gave us the equity of this guy. And they are telling us that what? The, Stated capital for this company was, let's say, um, hundred thousand, right? Was hundred thousand and retained earnings. Okay, retained earnings was let's say fifty thousand. Okay, this is what we have. Then they have revaluation surplus, right? Being 
uh, let's say 900,000. You have this in a scenario. Then they tell us our profit before tax, okay, which they have charged the interest, which includes interest and foreign currency loss, right? So there was a foreign exchange loss also included in our currency, right? In our profit before tax. So there was profit before tax of, let's say, 1.2 million, okay? After they charge what depreciation, let's say they charge depreciation of um, 500,000 and then GRA, GRA amount, capital allowance. Okay, so let's say there was capital allowance of let's, uh, 700,000. Okay, so this is the whole question. And they are telling you that one, let's apply thin capitalization rules, right? Thin capitalization rules. That's to get the interest allowed and foreign exchange loss allowed, and also get a tax payable by this company. If it's a manufacturing company located in Oboba, okay, somewhere in the district capital, somewhere. So, this is a simple question that we have. I hope you've got the metrics in this question. So, the first thing I would want you to do is to try to get what? the foreign exchange loss or assess the loan. Okay, I didn't give you the interest. Let's say interest is at 10%. Okay, so interest on the foreign loan is 10%. Okay, so this is what I've given you. So what we are going to do first is to first, one, I will determine the foreign exchange loss, determine the FX loss. Okay, so how do I do that? So first of all, I'm going to take what? The loan payable account and say that, okay, Opening balance on this loan was what? I borrowed what? $100,000, not so. But then I'm converting to Ghana CD. And it's 10 CDs as at first January, right? So as at first January, the loan should have been what? 1 million Ghana CDs, not so. Okay. Now at the end of the year, according to IES 21, we have to what? Retranslate this. So that same loan of 1 million, now they are telling us that the exchange rate was what? 12 CDs, right? So I multiply by 12 CDs. That means what happens? The closing balance is now what? 1.2 million. So 1.2 million means that something that is 1 million, if I'm paying you now, I'm going to pay you at 1.2. So me paying you at 1.2 means that there's a loss because our liability has increased, right? Which is our foreign exchange what? Foreign exchange loss, which becomes our balancing figure, right? So this 200,000, is the foreign exchange or the foreign currency loss. So the interest itself is applied from the start of the year to the end of the year, meaning it's applied on this amount, right? So in that case, the interest expense, which we charge the PL, is 10% of what? The 1 million. No, so 10% of the 1 million. Okay. So that gives me what? 100,000 interest, right? Expense. We they said they've already charged the PL. But I want to apply thing capitalization. Rate. So let's check. What debt to equity ratio arose because of this that we've done? So per the question, first of all, what is our equity? In the law, equity is stated capital plus retained earnings only. So our, re uh, our revaluation surplus, we have to ignore it. So stated capital plus retained earnings. Stated capital was 100,000 and retained earnings was what? 50,000, right? So in that case, if we want equity, equity now becomes what, 150,000, which we have got here, meaning we ignore any other reserve. So now our debt, which we have was actually what, 1 million. Okay. So we are saying that, okay, our allowable, or per the question, our debt to equity ratio was what? Debt to equity will be what? Our debt is 1 million. Okay. And our equity is what? Let's let's just make our uh, retained earnings also 100,000. I don't want any decimal. So also 100,000, okay? Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was 50,000, no problem. We can maintain it. So if this is it, if I want to get my debt to equity ratio, debt over equity, please, it's not equity to debt, it's debt to equity. So equity was 150,000, right? So our debt to equity ratio becomes what? 1,000 over 150. 
and that gives me 6.66 is to 1, right? 6.67 is to 1. This is the debt to equity ratio in the question, right? In the question. But in the law, what is the limit or the maximum debt to equity ratio that I can capture? It's 3 is to 1. 3.0 is to 1, okay? So you are saying that, okay, in excess, in essence, we only allow 3, but you charge 6.67, meaning how much should I disallow? It means that the disallowed debt to equity ratio is about, what, 3.67 is to 1, right? So you are saying that this is the total ratio. You are allowing 3, meaning you should disallow 3.67, okay? So I can simply get a ratio that if I want to allow anything, I can take this over the total. So 3.67 out of the total, which was 6.67, not so. And then if I want to disallow anything, that's the disallow, right? If I want to dis uh, allow anything, the allowable ratio was what, 3. So I can take my 3 out of 6.67 times whatever I want. So for instance, if I want interest allowed, I can simply take what? My 3 out of 6.67 times the total interest of 100,000, right? That will give me the interest that I should allow, which is six. 3 out of 6.67 times my 100,000. It means that the interest that I can allow as a deduction is 44,977.51, right? Meaning if I want to get interest disallowed, if I want to get interest to disallow, I can get what? 100,000 minus the 44,977.51, or I can just take my 3.67 over 6.67, times 100,000, I'll still get the same thing, okay? Which means that I can what? Can deduct 55,022.48, right? Or 49. The same can be done for the foreign exchange losses. So for the Forex loss, allowed Forex loss, Forex loss allowed, the same thing can be done. The allowable is three. So three out of the total, which is 6.67 times that one was 200,000, right? The loss that we got. So the same way, we trade out of 6.67 times 200,000. And that gives us 89955.02, right? So the same way, I can subtract it from 100, right? To get the original one, to get the disallowable portion. So that means disallowable Forex loss can be what? The 200,000 minus this 89,955.02. So 200,000 minus 89,955.02. And that's what? 110,044.99. Okay, so this is how you do think capitalization. However, there's another approach. If we say three is to one, it means that you need three times your equity as your debt, right? Then you can use that approach to, to get it. So if you are using that approach, you are saying that, okay, that one, you do not want to use debt to equity ratio, but you know debt to equity means the debt, the amount of equity that can make up the debt. So in that case, you can say that your allowable, what? your allowable debt is three times your equity, right? Three times your equity. That means our allowable debt is three times the 150,000 equity that we have, right? And three by 150, that means that is what? That is 750, right? Is it not 750? Ah, it's 450, sorry. So 450,000 becomes our allowable debt. So if, let's look at interest. So look at it. If, 450,000, I guess it will give us some interest that we don't know, okay? But we know that our total debt, which was 1 million, actually gave us interest of 100,000. You get the idea? Then our allowable, our allowable interest becomes what percentage? It becomes what? Our, our 450 out of the 1 million times 100,000 interest. And that gives us 450 out of 100,000, out of this times 100,000, and that's what, 45,000, okay? 
If you look at the other one and this one, it's still the same. It was 44, 9 something, almost the same. Right? That one was seven. So that is 45,000, meaning our disallowed, our disallowed interest will be what? 100,000 minus the 45,000. Which becomes what? 55,000. If you want to do forex loss, it's the same thing. Because that one, it will still be what? The loan over the total, the allowable out of the total, right? Times the foreign currency loss, which was 200,000 still. So it becomes 450 out of the thousand times uh, 200,000. That means we have 90,000. You see that one, we had 89 something. It's still close. It's because of I made it 6.67, that's why. So this one that we have, if we want the allowable what, forex loss, a disallowable forex loss, I can just what, take the 200,000 and less the 90,000 from it. Let's see. And that gives us 110,000 as what, allow, uh, disallowable forex loss. That's how you do think capitalization, right? So if I want to get my profit now, for the question, my profit and tax payable, or my chargeable income and tax payable, we start with the profit before tax. This is the approach that I will recommend. So for the question, we start with our profit before tax, and we said it was 1.2 million, right? But it already includes these things that we've done. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll add back the disallowable deductions also. So disallowed, Deduction. So disallowed deductions, I have what? First of all, I have depreciation. And the question said depreciation was what? 500,000. So I add back the whole 500,000. No, so apart from that, I will disallow the whole forex loss. Okay, so that I only come and charge the allowable part 200,000. And I'll disallow the whole interest. Okay, disallow the whole interest, which was 100,000, right? So I add back 800,000. I add back 800,000, giving me what? 2 million as my adjusted profit, right? 2 million as my adjusted profit. So after I get my adjusted profit, I'm now going to less other allowable deductions. So other allowable deductions, I had things like what? Capital allowance. The question said capital allowance agreed with GRE was how much? So we go back to the question. Capital allowance with GRE was 700,000. So in normal circumstances, you are going to calculate the capital allowance, but yeah, I just give you, when we get to capital allowance, we are going to talk about all that. So capital allowance, 700,000 will be taken out. Then I had what? The allowable Forex loss, right? The allowable Forex loss was what? 90,000 was allowable. Then allowable interest, right? The allowable interest was also 45,000, right? So. These are the ones that I can do that. So 700,000 plus 90,000 plus 45,000. That's 835,000 can be deducted as allowable deduction. Meaning this gives us our chargeable income. So that is what 835 gives 2 million. That means I have 1165,000. And since they said it's a manufacturing company, in Ghana, manufacturing companies has an incentive. It was located in a district capital, right? Not in a regional capital. So in that case, its tax will be at 12.5%. So that's the tax that we pay in this, which is 12.5%, which is 1.565. So this is how we do with think capitalization. Okay. So with income splitting, when you attempt to split income with another person, the commissioner general may, by notice in writing to that person, prevent a reduction in tax payout, okay? And he will serve you a notice. And the notice will, in the notice, he will adjust the amount to be included or deducted from your income for the purpose of calculating your income and recharacterize the source and type of any income loss amount or payment. So anytime you try to do income splitting, the commissioner general shall adjust your income. It's as simple as that. Now I want to go to mergers and acquisition, which feature as part of your exam almost every day, right? m and &E's, which is mergers, amalgamations, 
mergers, amalgamations, and reorganizations, right? Anytime something like this happens in your books, there are two scenarios. One, when you retain, when it happens and as a result of that, you retain ownership of at least 50%, then in accordance with section 47, it is exempt from tax. What does it mean? So look, this company A, not so, which sells, uh, let's say, 40% of its shares to company B. If you sell 40% of your shares to company B, it means how much do you still hold? How much do you still hold? Yes. I said I want the meeting to be interactive, but people have kept quiet and they are just listening. If I sell 40 to somebody, how much 60. do I still hold? 60. 60%. 60%. Oh, how much? 60%. 60. 60%. Meaning that I retain what? 60%. The law is saying that when this happens, this transaction is exempt from realization tax, right? Because I still have control over my original company, right? I'm still the controlling interest. And somebody is now the NCI, right? Or the non-controlling interest. So I still have control over my original company. But where you lose control, right? Where the change results in more than what more than 50 percent what change i get it within three years then we say you have deemed to have changed ownership right it results in what we call change in what ownership and this is dealt with under section 62. so what does this mean please be careful look at the question very very well okay because when i see it brings these things they are not going to be direct. They will hide it in a scenario. You have to open your eyes and check what they are asking for. So we are saying that if the change results in a more than 50% change within the three years period, you have changed ownership. And when you change ownership, that means now, look, A is selling to B, right? He sells his company to B, and let's say he sold 55% to B. That means how much does A retain? That means A retains 45%. 45. Has he lost control? Yes, he has. Yes. yes. Meaning that this results in change in what? Ownership, right? And once change in ownership happens, there are some things you must follow. There are some rules or conditions that go with change in ownership. And every question, every diet, this thing comes. One, immediately before the change, right? Immediately before the change, okay? All assets and liabilities have been deemed to be realized. Okay. To be realized immediately before the change. So it means that if you have an asset which had cost of 20, it can be sold on the market now for 30. It means that we'll have a gain on realization of 10, right? It has been realized too. You cannot deduction. You cannot deduct, so no deductions. That's what I wanted to say. No deductions or carry forwards for some particular losses, right? So first of all, you cannot carry forward losses from business. So if you have business losses, you cannot carry forward business losses under section what? 17. You cannot deduct financial costs under section 16. You cannot deduct bad debts or reverse bad debts under section 23. You cannot also carry back losses under long-term contracts under section 24, right? So always remember this. Business losses cannot be carried forward. Business or investment losses, financial costs cannot be deducted. Bad debts cannot be deducted. Long-term contract losses cannot be carried back to be deducted, right? Then finally, the period before and after the change shall be treated, shall be treated as two separate years of assessment, right? So if this transaction happened on first, uh, first, let's say 30th January. It means that any transaction, 30th January and 1st February, have any transaction before 30th and any transaction, the transaction that happened, sorry, 
will be split, right? Meaning that any time before 30th January is the first year of assessment, and any time after this is the second year of assessment. Even though it's the same year, we can split it into two, right? So that transaction is the building point. So this, these things that we have seen is the anti-avoidance provision itself, meaning that any time you see that somebody's shares have changed or somebody acquired 50% or more of the shares of another company within the previous three years, Immediately before the change, no assets have been realized. You cannot do that business sources, financial cost, bad debt, long term contract. And the period before the change and after the change shall be treated as two separate years of assessment. Remember this, I beg you, that's what you used to do the questions. So if they ask you, what is the tax planning? What is the tax planning around this? The tax planning around this is that you can make sure that the purchase that you do is done in smaller or smaller acquisitions or smaller percentages so that it exceeds three years, right? So if I buy 10% now, buy 20% now uh, in the next year, buy a further 10%, I've only buy, bought what? I've only bought what? 30 in the next three years, right? The next year, then I go and buy another 10. Then I go and buy another 10 again, right? So if you come from the previous three years, I have not exceeded what? 50%, right? So I have not triggered change in ownership, right? So this were the first part of advanced taxation. Let's go to the second part, which is question two, which is international tax, international taxation, right? So when it comes to international taxation, the first thing we have to look out for is what we mean by double taxation. So first of all, I can even start by, okay, can look at double taxation, what double taxation is. Okay, let's look at double taxation. Let's look at the connecting factors of double taxation, okay, which is the principle of residence and source. Okay, these are the causes of double taxation. Then from there, we are going to look at the methods of relief, the relief from double taxation, methods of relief from double taxation. Then four, we are going to look at DTAs, okay, double taxation agreements. Countries that have double taxation agreements are also there. So find bugs plus MMCS. Okay. Then we look at issues around permanent establishment, right? So when it comes to double taxation, I see it does not go very deep. At least these are the ones, then maybe Entitlement to treaty reliefs, entitlement to treaty benefits. Okay, at least these ones, when you know your chance of passing here are high. Okay, so these are the things I'm going to talk about in brief. It's actually a big area, but we will not waste so much time there. So let's start with double taxation. When we talk about double taxation, what is double taxation? Double taxation is the imposition of comparable taxes, right? Either between two jurisdictions or on this by the same jurisdiction on what income of the same person or two different people twice. So we are it means that if we say double taxation, it's either you are taxed on the same income twice by two separate states or two separate jurisdictions, which we call that juridical double taxation, right? So that's juridical double taxation. Juridical double taxation or we have one income tax twice in the hands of two separate taxpayers. We call that what economic double what taxation, right? So this is a, it's either juridical or economic in nature. So with juridical double taxation, one person is taxed twice. Okay, one person is taxed twice. I get it in two separate tax jurisdictions. Okay. One person is taxed twice in two separate tax jurisdictions. So if Kofi, mostly they'll tell you to give an example. So Kofi goes to UK, and also make income of 10,000 and pay tax at 20%, right? Meaning Kofi would have paid tax at what? That's about what? 2,000, right? Okay. He comes to Ghana, remits that same income to Ghana, the same tax, Kofi will be taxed at, let's say, 25%, right? So he will end up paying tax at what? 2,500. So you see there's double taxation. He was taxed in UK. He's also taxed in Ghana, right? Which is so bad. There must be a way to eradicate this. Then economic double taxation 
happens when one income is taxed twice at different levels. So for instance, a typical example is for corporate income tax. So if I have my corporate profit, remember, let's say 10,000. Remember that at the corporate level, it will be taxed at what? 25%, 2,500, right? Then this same income will be left with what? 7,500 as my profit after tax. Now this profit after tax, remember, if dividends are paid, let's say the whole thing was remitted as dividend 7,500. Remember in the hands of the shareholder, this dividend will also be taxed at 8%. Okay, so you see here, the same income is taxed twice in the hands of two separate taxpayers, one at the corporate level, two in the hands of the shareholder, right? So this is the difference between juridical double taxation and economic double taxation, right? With examples. So if they ask you, they'll tell you to give examples. Now that we know double taxation and what it means, double taxation, you see that it is, it is something that is bad, right? You paying tax twice has some effects. So what are the effects of double taxation? If if you are paying double taxes, what? One, it can lead to tax evasion and avoidance, right? Because nobody wants to pay, nobody wants to pay tax twice, right? Two, double taxation may discourage what? May discourage international trade. Not soon. Double taxation may hamper favorable tax tax uh, 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 administration, right? Because nobody wants to pay tax twice. And also, it can lead to multiplicity of taxes because different taxes are paid at different times on different incomes. Because of this, people will end up paying taxes so many times that they do not want, right? So there are so many reasons why double taxation is so bad. And there must be a need to what, eradicate double taxation. Now, before we eradicate double taxation, you must understand the main connecting factors. Two things must connect, right? to lead to double taxation. That is the principle of resident and source, right? So in simple terms, yeah, when we talk about the basis of taxation, every, every system in the world has a basis of taxation and it is based on two systems. Either you are basing it on a resident system, okay? So the resident system is what we call the worldwide taxation, right? And it is used worldwide now, except some few countries we do not adopt it. Then we have the source principle, right? Or the source-based system. And the source system says, oh, anything that arises in my territory is subject to tax in my country. And in Ghana, we apply both. If you are a resident in Ghana, you are taxed on worldwide income. If you are what? A non-resident, you are taxed on the territorial or the source system, okay? So what does it mean? It means that residents, all residents of a particular country, not so, are taxed on worldwide income. So it means that with respect to Ghana, you are taxed on your global tax liability, your global income, every income you earn everywhere. Meaning in Ghana, with respect to Ghana, if you have income brought into Ghana from a foreign state, which has a foreign source, right? That means there's a foreign source income or income received in Ghana from a foreign country, it has a foreign source, right? Or income that what? Accrued in Ghana. So you have an income that accrued in Ghana, which has a domestic source, or income that was what? Derived in Ghana, which has a domestic source. All these incomes, remember this is foreign income, and that is what? Domestic income. Because we are taxing you on worldwide income, all your income that come from both domestic and foreign source, you will be taxed in Ghana because you are a resident. Because you are a resident, all your income must be taxed in Ghana. But for non-resident persons, right, the source system applies to only non-residents. And for non-residents, we only tax them on income that has a source in Ghana. So the income must have a source in Ghana, meaning that what? Foreign source incomes are not considered. Only income accrued in Ghana and income derived in Ghana is taxed in Ghana for non-residents, right? That's a rule that you have to understand. So that is the basis of taxation or the connecting factors, but we have to dive into residence itself. We have to dive into residence. So we have talked about residence, but residence under the Ghanaian tax law is governed under section 101 from subsection one to four. We are going to talk about them briefly. So first of all, let's talk about individuals. Under what circumstance do we say individuals are resident? Individuals are resident if one, the person is a citizen of Ghana. 
So for citizens, there are two things. One, if the citizen has a permanent home, okay, in Ghana, but what? Stayed outside. Stayed outside for less than 365 days. He's still resident in Ghana. So the whole thing is that if you're a citizen, so far as you even stay in Ghana for just one day in a year, you are still a resident in Ghana. Two, still a citizen, right? But now your permanent home is in a foreign country, okay? So where you have your permanent home in a foreign country and you also stay there, right? you, you stayed here for less than three, six, five days, okay? You are still resident. Unless you stay in a foreign country for more than a year or more than three six, five days, then you are no longer resident here. So the whole thing is that resident is determined yearly. So you can be resident in Ghana this year, but next year you will not be resident in Ghana. That's a rule, right? So the whole thing is if you're a citizen of Ghana, even if you stay in Ghana for just one day or even two hours during a particular day and you go and stay the rest in a foreign country, you are still resident here. So far as you are a citizen, you are resident automatically, right? That's the first one for individuals. Second, this is what we mostly use or they will examine you on, okay? So when it comes to the second part of it, this is where we look at what? The aggregate number of days, okay, for non-resident. This one is mostly used for non-resident. So if you are a non-resident person and you stay 183 days or more, in aggregate, like when we add all of it, whether you went or you came back during that year, if we add all together and you stayed 183 days or more, we say you are resident in Ghana. So be careful. When a question comes and it's a scenario, you have to aggregate all the days the person stayed. I'm telling you, you have to aggregate all the days the person stayed and see if it is up to 183 days in any 12 month period. And the third one for non residents, sorry, the third condition is a special rule for government officials, right? There's a special rule for government officials. So if you're a government official posted abroad during the year, if you're a government official posted abroad during the year, you are automatically resident because the government of Ghana is the one paying your salary. So that's for individuals. And remember partnership in Ghana, we use a fiscal transparency rule. It means that partnerships are not taxed as partnerships. They are taxed as individuals, okay? So we are saying that when it comes to partnerships, which is section 101, Subsection two, it says that what a partnership is resident if only one of the partners, right? If only one of the partners resided or was resident, meaning one of the partners met the individual criteria as above. Remember, partners are also individuals, right? So if one of the partners was resident, we will deem that partnership to be resident in Ghana. That means that partner was either a citizen of Ghana, he was what. He was either having a, a permanent home but stayed less than three, six, five days there, not so, or stayed 183 days or more in aggregate in Ghana, then he becomes a resident in Ghana. So we go to resident trust board. So a trust is resident if only one, the trust is established in Ghana, okay, or two, someone. The person who controls the trust, like a director, which is a trustee, right, was resident in Ghana. Are you getting it? And then he does this, he does the control either alone or together with somebody. Then we could say the trust is what? Resident in Ghana. Established in Ghana, the person who controls the trust must be resident in Ghana. And the control he's doing is either alone or together with somebody or through other entities. Okay, then we, we still say the trust is resident in Ghana. Then we come to companies. A company is resident in Ghana under one of some circumstances, right? One, the company must be what incorporated under the company's act, right? So under the company's act. And two, or even if it's not incorporated under the company's act in Ghana, it's management and control may be based in Ghana, okay? So this one in the DTS, we call it the place of effective management, okay? So we have to look at things like what, where their headquarters is really, where their headquarters is located. We have to look at things like where their accounting books are kept, 
where the operating decisions are made, okay, where the directors do their meetings, all these things. This management and control is a big point, right? We have to evaluate all these things to actually check whether a company's management and control are in Ghana. So that was resident in the Ghanaian tax law. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is dual residence. Dual residence. Now, dual residence happens when two countries are saying that you are resident there. So maybe I am a citizen of Ghana. I stayed in Ghana just two months, but I stayed the rest in the UK. So UK is saying that you've crossed 183 days there, so you are resident. Ghana is also saying because you are a citizen, you are also resident there, right? So Ghana is saying you are a resident. UK is also saying you stay more than 183 days, you are resident. So it triggers dual resident. When there's dual resident, the DTM makes under the Article 4, under Article 4 talks about resident. Article 4, Paragraph 2, Okay, talks about dual residence for individuals. And for individuals, we use a special rule we call the tiebreaker rule. Okay, we use a tiebreaker rule. And tiebreaker rule simply says, okay, now you guys are having a conflict. Okay, so let's resolve the conflict. Let's see if the person has what? A an advantage or disadvantage to different countries. So one, we are looking at what? Where the person has a permanent home. Where does the person have a permanent home? Is he in Ghana or is he in UK? So we have to check. If we cannot determine whether you have a permanent home in both states or you have a permanent home in both states, it means that this test is inconclusive. We move to the next test. We ask ourselves, where do you have your center of vital interest? Your center of vital interest is simply where your economic and what personal relations are closer. Like where do you have your properties, your family, your children? We check all that. If it's inconclusive for Ghana and UK too, we move to the next test. Which says, okay, where do you stay often? Where is your habitual abode? Okay, if that one too, we cannot distinguish between Ghana and UK. Then we finally come and say, okay, finally, finally, where are you a national? Where are you actually a citizen? If that one too, we cannot determine, then the tax authorities will settle by mutual agreement. Okay, mutual agreement. So that's how we apply what? The tiebreaker when somebody is what? Resident in two or more countries at the same time. Two countries at the same time. Remember, Permanent home, center of vital interest, habitual abode, where is a national or nationality or citizenship, then if you cannot determine where you are national, then you settle by mutual agreement. Meaning that the taxpayer will submit his case, the tax authorities will sit and look at it, right? And now decide how to deal with this. Okay, they will decide that, okay, Ghana, I want you to take the residence of this person. Okay, so that was it for residence. Now, what are the causes of double taxation? Double taxation is caused. Double taxation is caused when there are conflicts between the connecting factors. Because where there are conflicts, okay, where there are conflicts between the connecting factors, okay? And what are the connecting factors? I told you the connecting factors are what? Residence and so So there are conflicts. So the first cause of double taxation is what? Residence source conflict, right? So resident source conflict is simply telling us that what? Um, one country is saying you are resident, say Ghana, right? Because I'm a citizen or resident of Ghana. And another country is saying I made money in their country, right? These two are conflicting. They can cause double taxation too. We have a source, source conflict, right? Source, source conflict is saying that, oh, um, maybe I was employed in Ghana, right? So Ghana says, oh, my income arose in Ghana, but maybe I was stationed in Nigeria. Nigeria is also saying I had physical presence there, so because of that, my income should be taxed there. So both of them are, are, are what saying that my income arose as source in, in Ghana or Nigeria. So both of them will be fighting. It leads to a source source conflict. Both of them will want to tax me. Hence, source source double tax, uh, juridical double taxation. Also, another cause of double taxation is residence residence conflict, right? where two residence systems overlap, which I explained earlier, right? So both of them are saying that I'm resident. The Ghana is saying I'm resident. UK is also saying I'm resident, right? If this happens, that means what? A residence resident conflict has happened. And this one, when this happens, mostly we solve it using the tiebreaker rule. I explained to you earlier that anytime you are dual resident, we use the tiebreaker rule to deal with it, okay? So these are the causes of double taxation, residence, resident conflict, resident source conflict, and what? Source to source conflict. Okay. 
So that is done. Now we look at relief from double taxation. Now, when we are relieving people from double taxation, there are two main methods. Okay, there are two main methods. So the first is what we call the credit method, okay, which mostly they are going to examine in your exam. Then the next method is what we call the exemption method, right? Where we exempt you completely from taxes that you paid in a foreign country. Okay, so we have the credit method and we have the exemption method. You should be able to deal with this. Now, there are other methods, okay, which stem came out from these methods, but I don't think I see a go that far. So we have what we call the deduction method. And deduction method, Ghana, we do not give deduction, but there's something we call relinquishment, okay? And that's the only time deduction is considered for foreign taxes. Relinquishment of foreign tax credits under section 112, subsection 3. Okay, so this is the only case under which we consider deduction. That's the our law. I will look at it. Then finally, we have something called a tax sparing or a tax sparing credit. So this is where we spare you for some taxes that you have been you are deemed to that you would have paid in a foreign country but we, we spare you of it. So let's say Ghana, um, let's say uh -huh, cattle farm. For the first 10 years, you are not paying tax, right? Okay, fine. You are paying tax of 5%. Now, if we go to our, back to our country in the UK, they are saying that, okay, you invested in Ghana, you should have paid tax of 25%. So they'll give you a relief for 25, but in actual sense, it's only 5% tax that you pay because this is the deemed tax that you should have paid, but you only paid 5% because there was a concession, right? So this one is done to actually encourage investment in other countries like cattle farm and the one I was talking about. So tax pairing credits, uh, it is also known as pioneer relief. It is to pioneer effective investments in some country. In Ghana, nobody, in ICA, nobody's going to worry with tax pairing credit, but that's what it means. We spare you of taxes that should have been paid in a different country. Okay, so now we take them one by one. We take the credit method. Okay, so the credit method is where we allow you a tax credit, right? We allow you a tax credit. You are allowed a tax credit or a tax relief against your foreign income tax, right? Against foreign taxes paid, right? Against your foreign taxes paid. So it means that if I have tax liability or tax payable in Ghana, right? Of let's say, 30,000 and I pay foreign tax, okay? So I'm going to list my tax paid or my foreign tax credit, right? Which is my double taxation relief of, let's say, if I pay tax of 10,000 in the foreign country to be treated as a deduction against my tax in Ghana. So I end up paying what? Net tax in Ghana for 20,000, right? So that's how it works. Very simple, very simple. Now, foreign tax credit, tax credit, has three types, okay? So forms of tax credit. Tax credit can either be what? Ordinary tax credit, okay? ordinary tax credit, or it could be a full tax credit. Now let's explain what it means. So look, we cannot give you anything that is more than the average rate of tax in our country. So let's say that if I go to UK, and I went to pay tax of, let's say, 30%, right? But Ghana, our tax is only 25. Remember, the maximum tax Ghana can give you is the 25, meaning that anything beyond 25, we cannot give you. So we limit it to 25 of the foreign income. This is what I mean. So let's say that we went to UK, we made income of what? 9,000, right? And we pay tax of 3,000, we pay tax of 2,700, right? On this income in the UK, look at what it means. Now, this is UK, meaning that the net income that we'll get to do it, 6,300, okay, 6,300, okay. Now this is net, but anytime we want to give a credit, it means it's on account, right? So when we come back to Ghana, because we are taxed on worldwide income as resident, we bring the whole income back to Ghana. So let's say this whole foreign income will become a foreign accessible income. So the whole 9,000, the gross income is what we bring. Please do not consider net income. Gross, 
So the gross income of 9,000 will be remitted to Ghana, right? But in Ghana, let's assume this guy is taxed at 25%. Because it's an individual, we will tax within graduated rate. But because of time, let's just say we tax him at 25%. So 9,000 at the 25% will give us what? That means the tax that we pay on this is 2 to what, 50. That means we cannot deduct anything beyond 2 to 50. But he paid 2,700, right? So the law is saying that, okay, what becomes a foreign tax credit? We cannot give him a full credit, right? We can only give him an ordinary credit, which is limited to what? The average Ghanaian tax rate, which is this 25. So if 25% tax was paid on your foreign income of 9,000, how much tax would you have paid? And that's 0.25 by what? The 9,000 foreign tax, which is 2,250. Meaning the tax credit I can give this guy is the maximum 2,250, right? I cannot exceed that. Meaning that that 27 cannot be claimed. I can only claim 2,250 against my income, right? So it means that if I want to get my tax liability, my foreign tax credit that I bought is only limited to what? 2,250, making this what? Zero now. Because this guy has no tax to pay again. Because the tax he paid was more than what Ghana can give you, right? Because Ghana is maximum. Why would you charge something more than the maximum? So that is what we call what? an ordinary credit, right? Then the next one is a full credit. Full credit, let's use the same scenario, right? Full credit means that we grant you the full credit. So let's say that now, when you went to pay the tax in UK, it was 10%, right? But Ghana, the tax is 25%. So using the same rule, right? Our income in the UK was 9,000, right? But you pay tax of what? You pay tax of what? 900, right? So if you bring, that means you have what? 8,000. 100. But I told you we do not consider the net, right? When we come back to Ghana, it's our gross income. So the gross foreign income was what? 9,000, right? When we pay tax in Ghana, we would have paid tax at what? 25%, which was what? Our 2,250, not so, okay? But this 2,250 is the tax you are paying in Ghana. But can we less the foreign tax credit? Yes, because the average tax rate in Ghana was more than the one in the UK, meaning that the foreign tax credit we can take all the 900 out of it, right? Then we get our net tax liability. So this is the difference between what? Your ordinary credit and what? Your full credit. Full credit, we deduct the full tax. Ordinary credit, we limit it to the average tax rate in our country, okay? So how do we do foreign tax credit? So all these reliefs that we saw, right? They are approaches that we can use to relieve people. And the approach can be through either a DTA or through a domestic law, right? And what we are looking at now is the use through what? the domestic law, which we call the unilateral approach. So here we are using the provisions in our domestic law to what? Relieve people from DT, to relieve people from double taxation using the credit or either what? The exemption method, right? So these are the ones that we look at. Using the DT, we make reference to Article 23A, exemption method, and 23B, credit method, okay? so. These are the two main approaches we use. So this is bilateral approach. And then we look at unilateral approach, which tends to use the domestic law. And that is what we are doing. So now let's look at how we apply the credit method in respect of our domestic law. That is section 112, right? Subsection 1, 2. And 3 has to do with relinquishment. So we are saying that anytime you are granted a foreign tax credit, it should not exceed the average rate average tax rate in Ghana. So the first thing you have to do is get your average tax rate in the foreign country for each income. So each income has its own credit, the same way that you can have withholding tax credit for dividend, interest, or anything. We get it from each separate income, right? Which means that this one, what you are going to do is that you are going to take what the tax paid in the foreign country over what your gross income times 100, okay? So it's always tax over income. Then the next thing to do is get your average tax rate, average tax rate in Ghana, okay? An average tax rate in Ghana, I get it. It's just taking what? Your tax that is payable over your chargeable income, okay? So Ghana is chargeable income times 100. In a 592, it used to be accessible income, but now it's chargeable income. When you finish, then you check. If average tax rate in Ghana is more than the average tax rate, in the foreign country, then you can grant a full credit, right? If the average tax rate in Ghana is less than the average tax rate in the foreign country, just like what we saw, it means that we cannot give you more than 
you can get. So we give you what a limited or ordinary what credit. And this limited credit, I told you, is calculated as what the average tax rate in Ghana times the foreign income, right? And that gives you the limit or the income that you are supposed to get. That's how it goes, right? So that is it. So let's take a simple question. The question is not actually that simple, but uh, at least it's worth it. You can do it. So Stella Koffer, we can see here. Stella Koffer retired from Stonebridge UK Limited, having served the company for 20 years meritoriously. She relocated to Ibuakwa in Kumasi, Ghana, where she commenced business as a security consultant to honorable politicians. She rented out a house in the UK for a yearly rent of what? 10,000 pounds. So that was the way. She also maintained a healthy balance in her account with gold bank in London. My income for the year was summarized as follows. That is the income in Ghana. So she received consultancy income net of taxes, gross dividend from success company. Rent was paid into a bank account of 9 thousand pounds they withheld thousand as a tax and her landing bank account credited interest okay so what we are going to do now is that first of all we are dealing with Stella Kofanos so the first thing we do is what to determine the average tax rates in the UK right and in UK the first we know average tax rate is the tax that was paid over the gross income right Please remember this, so that if the income is net, you gross it up. So first, they said she paid rent, right? So on the rent, we know that they said she has yearly rent of £10,000, right? So £10,000 is a gross income, but they said they would tell tax of what? Okay, rent paid was 9000 meaning they took tax of 1000 So the tax paid was £1,000, right? Over the what? The gross income of what? £10,000. So that means that her average tax rate in the UK for rent was what, 10%? Okay. Let's go to the second income. The second income that was paid to her was interest. They said what, her bank credited her with 4,500 bank interest. That's net, right? UK tax rate is 10%. So first of all, what was the gross interest itself? So they are saying that, okay, you had what? 4,500, right? which was equivalent to 90% because they took 10% interest. So if I want 100%, what would that be? It would be more. So if more, let's divide, right? So I can simply say that, okay, therefore, my gross, my gross interest will be what? 100 out of 90 times the 4, 5, right? And that gives me what? The gross interest, which should have been what? 5,000. It means that 5,000 is the total interest that she received, but they withheld what? 500, right? 10% of it. So in that case, that means if I want my average tax rate for the interest in the foreign country, it's going to be what? My 500 out of my gross income, which is 5,000 times 100. So you see, I grossed it up to work it out. So 500 out of 5,000, that means it's also 10%, right? It's just a coincidence, both of them are all 10%, 10%, okay? So now that's the first thing you have done. Now, we have to consider the impact of all our incomes in Ghana, including the foreign income, to come and determine the what? The net tax liability, right? So first, we need the average tax rate in Ghana, right? So average tax rate in Ghana means we first need to determine our chargeable what? income, okay? So let's determine our chargeable income for this guy. So chargeable income for Stella Koffa, right? I'll start with my domestic income. So for my domestic income, what did I have? She had income from business, right? She had consultancy income. Now note, the consultancy income that she had, it was net of taxes. Consultancy income is a service, meaning that withholding tax of 7.5 has already been captured, right? So that means this figure that we have here for 70,000 is actually equivalent to 92.5%, right? Because they've already stripped off what? 7.5 from it. Because everything is 100% original, and they've taken, what, 7.5. It means that you're left with 92.5. But I told you always, it's the gross that we bring. So you gross it up, then you can take a credit, right? That's how it works. So what becomes the gross income? The gross income is what we bring to the account. So 70,000 will be grossed up, right? So let's gross the 70,000 up. It means that to get your gross income, we take, what, 100 out of, what, the 92.5 times the 70,000, right? And that gives us, what? the original income, right? 
So that's 100 out of what? 70,000 times out of 92.5 times 70,000. And that's 75,675.68, right? So that is it. 75675.68. Okay, so that is the total consultancy income, right? But it says she received dividend. Now, dividend is final tax. It doesn't fit your account. So it will be taxed separately, right? It shouldn't come here. Then we just bring our foreign accessible income. So what was the foreign income tax she received? Or the foreign income she received, right? First of all, she received rent of how much? You know, you always have to bring the gross, remember. So the gross rent was 10,000 pounds. But they told you the exchange rates during that period was what? 6 CD to 1 pound. So I multiply by 6 CDs. So it means that in Ghana, we would have received 60,000 Ghana CDs rent. Then the interest that she received from the foreign country was also 4,000. 5,000 gross, right? But 4, 5 net. We need a gross, not the net. 6 CDs, right? Which is 30,000. Okay, So it means that our accessible foreign income is about what? 91,000, right? So if I add it up, that gives us what? Our total what? accessible income. Okay. Total accessible income. So if I add this to our 90,000, we end up with what? 165, 5.68, okay? So now, assuming Stella had some reliefs like child education, marriage, and all those, we'll take those ones out, right? Because they are relieved for individual. But since she doesn't have, meaning that her reliefs, and she doesn't also contribute to SNIT in Ghana, it means that her reliefs is nil. She still has 165675.68, right? As a chargeable work. As a chargeable income. So now that we've got this, we are going to include her income in what? The tax schedule, right? To get her tax. I don't have the, the rate, so let's use just an old rate. It will still work. I'm going to use the 2017, 2016, 2017 rate. That one is still in my head. I don't know why. So income rate and tax, right? So let's put it in this. So we know that the total chargeable income she had was 165675.68, right? That's the income. So here we take our first. 2,592 from here, 2,592 from here. So in exam, I'm just doing this to do a revision for this. We could have used a straight formula to get it. So this one is nail, it's free, so no tax, so nail. Take your next 1,296, will be taxed at 5%. So 64 is 80 persons. Then we take our next, one eight one two tax it at ten percent gives us one eighty one point two. Then we take our next thirty three thousand one hundred and eighty. Okay, that will be what taxed at seventeen point five five eight zero six. Okay. Then when you add all these ones up, you end up with 38880, right? This 38880 that we've added, which is the sum of all the, the deductions that we have made, right? If you add all up, this 38880, right? Is the sum of all these 25912 up to here. Can this be deducted from our income? Yes. Our income still has some, right? Because when we add everything back to the 165675.68, we can have an excess, right? The excess above the 3888. So the 165675.68 minus uh, 38880 will give us excess of 126795.68, right? So this will be taxed at the excess of 25%, and that gives us. So it means that the tax here becomes 31698.92. Okay, so if we add it, this becomes our tax liability, right? The total tax liability. So let's add it up 64.8 plus 181.2 plus 
And that becomes the total tax that we are supposed to pay in Ghana. So a revision on the graduated tax rate. Now, we need an average tax rate in Ghana, right? Which we said is the tax over our chargeable income, right? Times 100. Okay, so what's our tax? We know that our tax is the 37751.14. The chargeable income was what? We have to go and pick our check up with one six five, one six five six seven five point six eight times hundred. Right? So in that case, we have a thirty seven 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 five one point four three over one six five six seven five point six eight times hundred. That means we have twenty two point seven eight or seven nine percent, right? So twenty two point seven nine percent becomes what? The average tax rate in Ghana. Now, we have to assess and see. Are you getting it? So our uh, average tax rate. If you look at Ghana, average tax rate is 22.79, right? Look at UK. When you look at what? Rent, it was 10%, right? When you look at interest, it was also 10%. And all these are less than the 22.79, right? Meaning we can grant, all of them, we can grant full credit. No reason. That means all of them you can grant full credit. Okay, so what is her net tax liability now? But first of all, let's determine our foreign tax credit. So our foreign tax credit, we know for rent, she paid tax of a thousand pounds. So thousand pound, bringing it to Ghana City, we know it's six cities, right? Meaning she would have paid what? She would have got six thousand tax credit in Ghana. Then interest, she paid tax of what? Five hundred pounds. So at six cities, that means what? She would have got what? 3,000. So a total foreign tax credit she can claim is 9,006, right? Apart from that, she has other tax credits. She had withholding tax credit in Ghana, right? So the withholding tax on the consultancy fee, remember, it was on account, right? It was services. So the tax on the consultancy fee will be what? 7.5% times the gross consultancy fee, which is 7567 Six seven five or seventy five. We did it. Let's go and check. When we gross it up, seventy five six seven five point six eight. Right. So when we take seven point five of that, that becomes what? That becomes a withholding tax credit on the consultancy fee. When we seventy five by seventy five six seven five point six eight. Okay, that's five six. 75.60, right? So once that we have this, we have other taxes, right? So there was other taxes in the question, which include what? The dividend withholding tax. So we know dividends have withholding tax at 8%. So the dividend received from success company, which was 10,000 cities, we will take 8% of it, right? So that becomes like, was it 800? So that is it. So now what's her net tax liability in Ghana? So we get her net tax liability. So we get a tax on chargeable income, which is a tax payable on a chargeable income. And that was 30, 37, 751 or something. 37, 751, Then we less the tax credit, right? So the tax credit she had, she had one, Foreign tax credit, right? So foreign tax credit, which was what nine thousand. No, so then we had withholding tax credit. Withholding tax credit, no, so which was also uh what the withholding tax credit was five six seven five point six five six seven five point six six. So you add all this up, and that gives you what. 14675.65 and then deduct it from your tax payable to get the net, net tax payable. Dividend is on a is final, it does not come and add up to this. It's a final tax. That's why I've separated. So that was how to deal with foreign tax credit. Are we okay? Now, when it comes to exemptions under the law, the exemption method, there are a lot of exemptions. Any exemption that you think about is 
an exemption method, like from section seven. The exemptions for like shipping and air transport business. So if you deal with shipping and air transport business, okay, there's what we call the reciprocity rule. That says that, okay, so far as you are dealing in shipping and air transport businesses in Ghana, okay, and you are not resident. So far as your country can give Ghanaians the same similar exemption, then the commission shall allow you. Then we look at employment income of residents, okay, foreign employment income for Ghanaian residents. So if you're a Ghanaian resident and then you receive a foreign employment income, provided that, so this is dealt with under section 111 subsection 2. So provided that you are a Ghanaian resident and then you are employed by a non-resident employer, if you're employed by a non-resident employer, or you are employed by a resident employer, but you didn't stay you stayed in a foreign country for more than 183 days, okay, or 183 days or more in a foreign country, then your employment income is exempt, right? So your employment income is exempt, okay? And then we have exemption for, exemption for the foreign permanent establishment. Or let me see, exemption for foreign branch. If you're a Ghanaian and you have a foreign office, foreign branch, foreign workshop outside Ghana, right? So far as it means the definition of a foreign permanent establishment, it's exempt from tax. Okay, so that's the exemption methods under our Ghanaian tax laws, right? So there are lots of them. So foreign permanent establishment is exempt from tax. Okay, you can make reference to section 107, subsection one. You can make reference to section 112, subsection two. Okay, so, yes, Tina, your hand is up. Tina, you can talk. Okay, Prof, so I have a question there. Uh, when you you when you are, yes, please, or oh, clarification, if you can clarify this for me. When mm -hmm. you're a, a foreign PE, yeah. Um. The period of six months, mm -hmm. your tax is exempted. You don't yeah. pay tax. So what happened? Mm -hmm. Um, you start paying tax in the foreign land after six months. So right home in Ghana, what happened from the first to the six months? No, it's exempt from tax in Ghana, but in a foreign country, it's taxed. So let me show you the thing. A PE is simply the business of a non-resident, right? Under Article 5 of the DTS, it says what? A permanent establishment is a fixed place through which the business of an enterprise can be carried on partly or wholly, partly or wholly carried on. Now, listen, if you have a PE, it's a subject to source rules. Even when we make reference to sections, section 3, subsection 2B, it tells us that so far as you have an income as a non-resident, you have an income in Ghana relating to a PE. All incomes that are attributable to the PE will be taxed in. Meaning, if I have a PE in UK, all income subject to what? Attributable to the PE will be taxed in the UK. When it is brought to Ghana, the rule, this rule is exempting the PE from tax only in Ghana. It means in that country where the PE is, it will be taxed there. Do you get it? So for that six-month period, your income will be exempt from tax here if you remit it. Do you get it? If it goes beyond that six months, you still have a PE there. Meaning that if... The six months is what triggers the PE. But if you do that business, the less than six months, it does not contribute a PE. Okay, it does not constitute a PE. Meaning if you bring income, it will still be taxable under worldwide income rules. Okay, Tina, so less got, than six months is taxable it's here. It's not a PE, yes. Okay, okay. A Thank foreign you. PE only happens if you do an activity which is not preparatory or auxiliary in nature continuously for six months. So the six okay. months is what triggers a PE in a foreign country per our law. But remember that the foreign country itself has its own laws for PE. But to assess whether it meets the definition of foreign PE in our law, that is why you need to assess the six months and the preparatory auxiliary day. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So in Ghana, we do not give what? Deduction for tax pay, right? But our law allows relinquishment. So you see the case of Stella Koffa, right? 
for seller for five. If the question told you that, okay, she doesn't want to claim a credit, but she wants relinquishment, meaning she wants to claim a deduction for the foreign taxes paid. So that means that if you are doing relinquishment, what you are going to do is that what? You are going to grant her a deduction. So this is what it would have been, meaning no credit. So we would have taken her income, right? So her domestic income was what? The consultancy fees, right? So we would have taken the consultancy fees, okay, of the 75675.68, also. Then we would have added the foreign income, right? So a foreign income that we had, we had rent of how much? 60,000 also. And then we had what? Interest of how much? 30,000 also. We add it up, that's about 90,000. That's what gave us the 165675.68, right? So this becomes like an accessible income. Then we less allowable deduction, right? So the only allowable deduction we can give here because of relinquishment, are you getting it? Is the foreign taxes fee. So here the foreign taxes are treated as a deduction, allowable deduction. And the total foreign tax she paid was worth what? We claim a deduction for a foreign taxes, which is what? The interest one she paid for 500, which is now what? 3,000 Ghana cities, also. And then the one that was what? 1,000 pounds, which is 6,000. So she'll get a deduction for the 9,000. Are you getting as an allowable expense before we now calculate her tax on this? So it means that her chargeable income would have considered the impact of the foreign taxes inside there. This is what we call relinquishment. So 165, 675.68 minus our 9,000. So it means that she will end up with chargeable income of 156, 675.68, right? And this one is now that we are going to pay tax on it. Let's say that we tax it at 25%, right? So the only thing we can now deduct from this is any domestic withholding tax credits because the foreign taxes have been considered as a deduction in her income. This is the only case under which deduction is given for foreign taxes under a Ghanaian tax law. Apart from this, there's no other deduction again. This is the only time deduction can be given. Is that okay? So that was about foreign tax credit. So the next question is about countries' DTAs. DTAs are just double taxation agreement, right? Agreements we enter into to what? Relieve people from double taxation and also what? Prevent tax avoidance and evasion, right? That's the main purpose of DTA. And a DTA can be classified in two different scopes, right? The classification are either based on what? Uh, the, the scope of the treaty, what is covered. So by scope, a DTA can be what? A comprehensive DTA. Comprehensive DTAs cover all income types or mostly taxes on income and capital, which is the normal type we know, right? And then we have what we call multilateral DTAs. So multilateral DTAs are DTAs which cover more than... Uh, let me see. I'm talking about scope, sorry. <laughs> we have comprehensive and limited DTA. So limited DTA covers some type of incomes, right? Mostly inheritance taxes in the UK, property taxes, I get to know, maybe shipping and air transport. So those ones cover only specific types of income. Then the next classification is based on the parties, the number of parties to the treaty. So based on parties, a DTA can either be bilateral, which is a common type. This is what we actually call a DTA, double taxation agreement, right? So this one, bilateral means two countries come together. Okay, then we have what we call multilateral. Multilateral is where more than two states, okay, more than two states come together, right? So more than two states come together. That's what we call the multilateral DT, right? So these are the classifications of DT. Now, what countries does Ghana have DTAs with? Okay, so I said you spine bags. Fine bags plus MMCS. So we have France, Italy, Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium, UK, Germany, sorry, Switzerland, South Africa, Mauritius, Morocco, Czech Republic, and Singapore. France, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, United Kingdom. Germany, 
South Africa, Switzerland, Morocco, Mauritius, Czech Republic, Singapore, right? Okay. So these are the countries that Ghana has DTAs with. I hope that is okay. So the next question they can ask you is the importance of DTAs or the significance or objectives of DTAs. Make sure you can write that. DTAs help to relieve double taxation, help to prevent tax evasion and avoidance, protect shipping and air transport businesses, bring about mutual agreement between the states, can lead to exchange of information, brings about non-discrimination, uh, promotes international trade. Okay, so remember this. So that was about um, double taxation and its connected issues. Now we come to the issue of permanent establishment. Now, before we look at permanent establishment, we have to look at how countries or how people establish physical presence in a country, right? So looking at permanent establishment, before we even look at permanent establishment, we have to understand two things, which is trading in a country or simply trading in Ghana versus trading with Ghana. This is trading with Ghana. Now, what does this mean? So trading in a country connotes physical presence, right? This is what creates a being. This connotes physical presence. So you must understand. This connotes physical presence. So if you are in Ghana, what will connote physical presence? It's either you accrue, if it's an individual, right? If it's an individual, we say that you are trading in Ghana. If the income you derive is accrued in Ghana, right? Physical activity or is derived in Ghana, right? So that means it has a source in Ghana. Then you are trading in Ghana. Okay, so it connotes physical presence, meaning there's some sort of source related, right? Of source relation or what we call nexus. Nexus means connection to a physical jurisdiction. That's what we see in nexus in terms. Now, trading with Ghana means that there's no physical presence, right? There's no physical presence, but just a mere connection, right? So no physical presence. So how, when it comes to individuals, the income must work. Be either brought into Ghana, for instance. The income is brought into Ghana from a foreign country or received in Ghana from a foreign country, right? So then it has no physical presence. That's for individuals. Now let's come to entities. When we say an entity is trading in Ghana, what does it connote? It connotes physical presence. So there must be what? A place of what? There must be either a place of business in Ghana, a place of management, a place of management in Ghana, an office, a branch, a workshop, right? Or a place of control, a place for which you exercise control, which is at your disposal. Are you getting? Or a place of contract. So we are saying that, yes, these things are evidence that a business is sort of going on in Ghana. Right, which means that you are trading in Ghana. If you are trading with Ghana for entities, it's still the same thing. There's no physical presence, right? So these things cannot be found there, right? Meaning that you could have an online transaction of some sort, which has no connection with Ghana, right? And this is one of the reasons why uh, income characterization under the digital economy is so difficult to identify, right? So this is it. Trading in Ghana and trading with Ghana, they can ask you for some five to six months, not bad. So let's look at permanent establishment. Under the DTAs, I'll make reference to the DTAs because the DTAs are read in line with the domestic law. Now, before we even carry out, there's some rule that you have to understand with DTAs under section 98 of our domestic law, right? International arrangements. Section 98 of the Revenue Administration Act. Now, one rule you must understand is that where there is a conflict, okay? So where there is a conflict between an international arrangement, which is simply between a DTA and uh, domestic law provisions, okay? And domestic law provisions, the DTA shall override or shall prevail over the domestic law. Please remember this. When you're answering questions that involve DTA, you have to say, so when there's a conflict between a DTA and uh, a provision in, say, at 896, okay, the DTA shall take precedence over it. Okay, so remember this. 
And also another issue you must understand is the issue of collection of taxes. The Commissioner General can also help other countries to collect taxes of tax debtors in Ghana. Okay, so it means that when somebody owes tax to, let's say, Italy, right, and then that person is in Ghana, the GRA can collect tax for Italy on behalf of what Italy in Ghana from that taxpayer here. Okay, so remember this. Okay, so now we continue with where we were. So a permanent establishment is just what? A fixed place of business. So a fixed place through which, okay, through which the business of an enterprise, through which the business of an enterprise is partly or wholly carried on. Okay, partly or wholly carried on. Okay, so fixed place signifies we have a fixed place we need. So anytime you have this sort of fixed places at your disposal as a non-resident, like a branch, okay, a place of management, a workshop, an office, okay, a mine, an oil and gas well, a quarry, okay, or any other place where we extract natural resources, it constitutes a PE in itself. So the nature of the activity itself means there's a fixed place as your disposal. You get it. So when you have a fixed place as a non-resident, remember, you cannot have a fix, you cannot have a PE as a resident person. No resident can have a PE in himself. It's not possible for a Ghanaian himself to have a PE in Ghana. It's for non-resident. Meaning a Ghanaian can have a PE in a foreign country, which we call a foreign PE, okay? But a Ghanaian cannot have a PE in Ghana. It's only a non-resident who can have a business in Ghana, right? Which we call a PE. So with that being said, there are two types of PE we consider under our domestic tax law, right? So there are two types. We have what we call a foreign permanent establishment, a foreign PE, which means this one is owned by a Ghanaian resident, right? I told you you cannot have PE in your own country, meaning this is owned by a Ghanaian resident. Then we have Ghanaian PE, okay? You have a Ghanaian PE, which means that this is owned by a non resident right which means this is owned by a non-resident right so with this being said we have to look at them in our law right so this one we know is exempt from tax in ghana so this one is basically exempt from tax in ghana we discussed it earlier on but this one is taxed in ghana okay and what are the rules it's taxed in ghana when we visit section 107 it's taxed in ghana like any other resident company so taxed like any other resident company, okay, so this will be taxed like any other resident company and therefore can withhold taxes. You can withhold taxes like any company, okay. It pays taxes. That means this one will pay tax at the normal 25%. Then what happens is that when it remits, when it remits funds, okay, those funds are also taxed at 8%. We call that branch profit tax. Okay, so it's a tax like any other uh, company, like any other resident company. So it means that a P is effective tax liability is what? 25% for paying its normal tax and then 8% for branch profit tax, right? Meaning that the effective tax rate is 33%. A normal company, a normal Ghanaian company also has the same tax because it will pay corporate income tax at 25%, not so. Then when it pays dividend to shareholders, dividends to shareholders, it will also pay at what? 8%, bringing us the same 33. So some questions to ask you, uh, what are the tax incentives? Consider whether it is better to set up a PE or to set up a Ghanaian company or a subsidiary. The net effect is that subsidiaries and PEs have the same tax liability because PE 25, branch profit tax 8, making 33. Ghana company, 25, dividend 8%, making 33. Just that the advantage a company has over a PE is that a company can go into a business which a PE cannot do. A PE can only do the business experience company is doing. That's the only thing, PE versus 
subsidiary they ask you that's what you have to say right so that was it now if you are looking at what a Ghanaian PE is first of all a Ghanaian PE signifies one a place at your disposal right so a place at the disposal at disposal of non-resident right so if the non-resident person has a fixed place or a place at his disposal, it could be a rented or owned place, it's a PE. Two, if the person is doing installation of machines, a place where they are installing machines or equipment, it constitutes a PE. No, 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 no. That listed company paying 22. It's no more. It was on, it was up to 2022. 2022 is gone. 2021, sorry, 2021 is gone. Listed companies still pay 25%. Please, I beg you, is that okay? It is hotels that pay 22, yes. But listed companies used to pay 22, but that was in the past, it is no more. So when you are installing machines as a non-resident in Ghana, it's constituted PE3. If you are doing a construction, assembly, or supervise, supervision activity, right? Well, on sorry. the construction site, okay? Do the installation. For 90 days or more, this is the only time there's a deadline, okay? If you carry this out for 90 days or more, it creates a P. Somebody was saying something. Yes, please. Somebody also, was saying something. What about the installation thing to the caveat of 90 days holds the... No, 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 no. Insta the installation... No days. Disposal, no days. If you have a place at your disposal, no days. The only time, I said this is the only time there's a caveat. There's a limitation. 90 days only applies to construction, assembly, and supervision activities. Is that okay? Any other thing here? So far as you buy a place and you are using it, an office, wherever, it is automatically a PE. There's no restriction. It's only construction, assembly, and supervision activities. Are you getting it? that have a caveat, 90 days or more, that constitutes a PE. Is that okay? Very well, thank you. Okay, sure. Now, if you have an agent who works only for you, okay, so an agent who works only for you, habitually carries out contract on your behalf, he's solely remunerated by you, and he also, if it's an insurance business, he collects premiums on your behalf, then that constitutes a P because that agent is working like your branch here. Do you get the idea? But if it is an independent agent, let's say that you tell MTN to do data services for you, it means that MTN does it for every uh, other person. So it's not working directly for you. So if it's an independent agent working in its ordinary course of business, it doesn't constitute a P, right? So this was permanent establishment under our tax law. You must be able to explain this, you must be able to explain the foreign, foreign permanent establishment and Ghanaian permanent establishment. Are you getting it? That is it. But then they can ask you who is an owner. An owner is somebody who owns a person who owns what? Who owns a permanent establishment. So anybody who owns a PE is called an owner. That's all. They can bring this for one mark. And one mark can change you from 49 to 50. Okay. Now let's go to the issue of branch profit tax. So branch profit tax is repatriated profit tax. That's how we used to call it, repatriated profit tax. So we are saying that, okay, if you are a Ghanaian company, a, a Ghanaian PE, and you pay out repatriations to your parents or your headquarters, right? There's a tax you pay at 8%. So this is calculated as 8% on your profit after tax. And this profit after tax is determined as your profit before tax, right, which is your adjusted profit, we know that. Your profit before tax. So how do you get profit before tax? In tax. A profit before tax, you know, it's known as a chargeable income also. So this one, you get it by calculating your chargeable income, which means you have to go and work your chargeable income. So if my chargeable income was 100,000, and I calculate tax, let's say my tax payable on this chargeable income to be, let's say, 20,000, right? The 80,000, which is my profit after tax, and that is 80,000, right? I'll get my branch profit tax at 8% on this, right? 
which is about 16,000, right? So that is how you do branch profit tax, okay? So meaning all the rules that apply to permanent establishment, uh, the chargeable income still apply, capital allowance, uh, losses, all those things. I told you a PE is taxed like any other resident company. So all those rules we know for resident companies will still apply. Do you get it? All those rules will still apply. Is that okay? So please do not forget. Please do not forget. Do you get it? So the whole thing, the whole thing is that when it comes to um permanent establishment or branch profit tax, instead of getting instead of getting a normal um corporate tax question, they can decide to bring a uh, branch profit tax. When you are going to do everything, calculate capital allowance, do everything, get your tax payable. After getting your tax payable, you deduct it from your chargeable income. When you finish, then you take that tax from your chargeable income to get your profit after tax, and now take 8% of it as your branch profit tax. Meaning it's a two-way calculation. So it's like any other computation, right? So that's branch profit tax, right? There's another way There's another way you can also determine what this type of taxes, right? Where they use the accounting approach. So accounting approach, they may tell you that the company had net assets, okay? You had net assets brought forward of, let's say, uh, 10,000 or so. And then they tell you profit for the year for the company was what? They made profit of 100,000 for the year. By the end of the year, the net assets carried forward was, let's say, um, 80,000, okay, 80,000. So if you have something like this, if you have something like this, what are they trying to tell you? It means that you have to establish the account to move. So if you put it together, you know that the opening net asset was this. If you add it up, you have 110,000. So if 110,000 at the end of the year, it reduced to 80, what does it tell you? It means that you repatriated profits at what? You repatriated about what? 30,000 profits out of your business. And that tells us that this constitutes what? Repatriated profits or branch profit, right? So that repatriated profit will tax it at what? The 30,000 will be taxed at what? 8% as my branch profit tax, okay? So these are the rules that I need you to what? understand. Okay, so that was about permanent establishment. Now, I'm not going to talk about expenses because everybody here has done permanent establishment. You've done capital allowances. You've done all those things. The time is so limited. Within these few short times, I want to talk about how to um, deal with other issues. So when it comes to financing, I want to talk about the issue of tax planning, right? The tax incentives that you have under the law, at, at least then I've covered everything under tax planning. I think that will help us, right? Because of the time, I've literally done more than half of the syllabus. Okay, so when it comes to, first of all, deductions, let me just zoom this up. Yeah. So when it comes to allowable deductions, there are specific deductions that you need to follow to be able to what, deduct, right? And the first rule that you have to understand for deductions is the receivable deduction rule under Section 9. Okay, we said that what? Every expense that you deduct should be wholly. That means the whole amount should be deductible. It should be exclusively, which means... The purpose for which the expense was incurred must be relevant to the operation of the business and necessary, which, which implies our work. The expense must be inevitable. You can't go away without. So what expenses must not be deductible? So if the expense meets the wholly exclusively deductible criteria, then it should be deducted. If not, it is not deducted. So any expense which is not wholly exclusively and necessarily incurred, it's not an allowable deduction. Any expense of capital nature is not allowable. Any expense which is a domestic or excluded expenditure is not also allowable. So when we talk about domestic and excluded expenditure, domestic expenditure and excluded expenditure are dealt with under Section 130. Now, a domestic expenditure is an individual's expenditure for his personal needs, like your clothing, your shelter, commuting from work, going to work, and non-business related education, right? Then expenditure that somebody spends on your behalf is also domestic expenditure, right? Now, if you borrow interest, if you go and borrow for your domestic expenditure, the interest on that borrowed funds is not allowable deduction. Please remember this. They can trick you in a question. That's under Section 130. Then excluded expenditure includes things like taxes under the Act. If you see tax in financial statement, you have to disallow. 
tax against tax, not against income. Remember, if you see tax deducted against income, take it out, add it back, right? Expenditure related to bribes, penalties, interest, fines paid to government, not allowed. Expenditure for exempt amounts or final withholding payment, retirement contributions, unless they are included in employees' income. So if you see SNIT, uh, payee, those things, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, right? If they are included in somebody's income or the employee's income, then it's allowed. If not, it's allowed. Dividends are not allowable deductions then depreciation, not allowed. So these ones are all disallowable expenses. So if you get a question, open your eyes. So apart from that, there are other specific allowable deductions stated under our act, okay? So interest incurred by borrowing money to buy an asset to produce income. We've been talking about it from the start of the class, right? We have trading stock, cost of sales is deductible, repairs and improvement up to some level, research and development expenses, capital allowances, specific bad debts, rent, advertisement costs, loss on realization of assets and liabilities, financial costs under certain conditions, losses from business or investment, contribution to a worthwhile cost, fresh graduate deductions, and realized foreign exchange losses, right? Just to help you out with the computation of income, I'll walk through them. Interest, we've already talked about interest. We've talked about thing capitalization, right? Now, I want to talk about financial cost deduction. Now, if you have a gain or a loss from a financial instrument, right? The law, the law says that that loss, you cannot deduct all. The limit, there's a limit on the amount of loss to deduct, which is 50% of your adjusted chargeable income plus the financial gain. So a typical example is simple, right? So let's say we had a chargeable income of what? 100,000, right? But this chargeable income includes a financial cost. Let's say we made a loss on a hedging transaction, right? And that loss was, let's say, um, 800,000, okay? And then we ended up with a financial gain of let's say 200,000. The law is saying that before you can apply this rule, you must do your adjusted chargeable income. Adjusted chargeable income is the chargeable income without the gain and without the cost. So if loss, the cost or the loss was deducted before arising at the, arriving at the chargeable income, how do we do this? We must add it back, right? And less this gain. If I do it, I now get my adjusted chargeable income, not so. So I get my adjusted chargeable income and my adjusted chargeable income is not going to be what? That's going to be my 100,000 plus my 800,000 minus my 200,000. That means I have what? 700,000 as my adjusted chargeable income. So now I must take what? I want to get my allowable financial cost that I, I can deduct, which is what? 50% of what? My adjusted chargeable income and 50% of it is what? 50% of 700,000 is what? 350,000 plus the financial gain, right? The financial gain was how much? The financial gain was 200,000, meaning that the allowable financial cost that I can deduct is what? 550,000, okay? So this is the allowable financial cost. Now, this allowable financial cost that I have, the one that I charge in my account was 800,000. It means that the excess, that's the 800 minus that 550, which is 250,000 shall be disallowed and carried forward for five years, right? So for five years, we can, disall we can disallow this and carry it forward for five years, right? That's how this one works. I hope that is easily and well understood. So get your adjusted chargeable income, meaning work through your normal chargeable income, add back your financial cost, less your financial gain. When you finish, take 50% of it, add the financial gain, then that gives you your limit. Then compare it to what was actually the financial statement, and the difference is what you now disallow and carry forward for five years in the order in which the loss was incurred, right? So that was it. Now, one thing you must understand okay. is that in terms of petroleum and mining, these ones are known as relevant financial costs and relevant financial gain. Now, when it comes to petroleum and mining, the allowable financial cost is just the financial gain. It means it's limited to the financial gain. So with this question, that 800,000 that we saw, which was the financial cost, if I want my allowable financial cost, it will be limited to what, 200,000. So that means per the question, allowable financial cost will be what, 200,000. So if it is limited to 200,000, that means the excess of what, 600,000 shall be carried forward for five years. And any excess, I get it, will disallow it and carry it forward for five years. So that's how it works. So for petroleum and mining, your allowable financial cost is what limited to the financial gain. So if it is more than the financial gain, the excess will be carried forward, right? But where 
this is the only case where the commissioner has directly stated in the act how to deal with financial uh, instrument, right? The gain on it. So if the financial gain is greater than the financial cost, the commissioner says set them off, meaning that I will now take out what? Assuming the financial cost was, uh, let's say, 105,000, and the financial gain was 200, meaning there's a gain or loss on hedging, meaning I'll have 95,000 gain, right? That's the only time at which we can set off a gain against what? A loss. Only under petroleum and mining. That's what it says. So that was about financial cost limitations, and it mostly comes. Then when we come to foreign currency losses, an amendment was passed recently, but under the Act 1094, okay? So note that deducting for foreign deduction for foreign exchange losses, which were dealt with under Section 25, are now limited, particularly related to debt claims, obligations, and currency obligations. What we are saying is that only realized foreign currency losses are allowed as allowable deduction. When we say realized foreign currency losses, what does it mean? Now, IES 21 tells us that once we have monetary items and we are retranslating them, right? we should retranslate at every year end, but there's no cash movement on them. That means if I have a loss on that type of transaction because of recharacterization or retranslation, we do not touch it, right? It's not real. So we do not allow it for tax purposes, right? But when it is real, meaning that I actually paid cash, I was only owing you 10,000, right? When the exchange rate was 10 CD, now I'm owing you 12,000. If I pay you that 12,000, I've, I've made a loss of 2,000, which is in actual cash settlement. That realized foreign currency loss is an allowable deduction, okay? Also, any unrealized losses are not allowed. We saw that. And also transactions, foreign currency losses between resident persons are also excluded expenditure. They are not allowed as deductions. If you incur a foreign currency loss in respect of an asset which you bought, Okay, let's say I bought an asset for 10,000, but the exchange rate was higher. So I uh, what? I made a loss on the asset because I paid more, right? That foreign currency loss must be added in your capital allowance computation. You must capitalize it. If it was expense, you have to reverse it. So that is it. These are the technical areas. Losses from business or investment, we know that what? If you have a loss from business or investment, you can carry it forward for five years now for all sectors before. It was three years for non-priority sector, and what? Five years for priority, but now all other sectors, five years, okay? So if you have two separate businesses, okay, and they are different rates, let's say that I sell in the domestic market and I sell in the export market. So non-traditional goods, if I export is 8%, right? And then traditional goods, if I sell within the domestic economy, is 25. Now, be careful. If you have a loss, you cannot charge this one's loss against this one. It doesn't work like that. Or this one's loss against that one. We don't do it like that. What we do is that if I operate um, a cow business 25 and I operate a manufacturing business 25, because they are all at the same rate, I can set the losses up. So this is one rule. Also, you cannot deduct business uh, investment loss from business income, but you can deduct what? Business loss from investment income. So... A typical example, a typical question where they give you this is that they'll tell you, let's say 2019, okay, you had a business income of, let's say, 30,000, right? Business income of 30,000, and I had investment loss, right? We had investment loss of, let's say, 10,000. Can we set this up? We cannot set it up. We leave them as they are, right? Because the law says that we cannot set investment loss against business income. It doesn't work. But when we come to 2020, let's say 2020, we had an investment income, a full investment income of let's say 100,000, right? But we had a business loss, right? We had a business loss of let's say 50,000. What happens is that this business loss that we have, we can set it up against our business income, including the investment loss carried forward from the last year, right? So investment loss, carried forward from the last year of 10,000. We can also set this off, right? So that means that we have 40,000 as a chargeable income. So this, when it comes to losses, these are the rules that I think are confusing to students. And when they ask you for unrelieved loss, this is a loss that have not yet been deducted, okay? And a loss from business or investment happens when your, your allowable deductions are more than your accessible income. Okay, that's when you have a loss from business or investment. The next one is losses from realization. If you sell your assets and you make a loss, right? How do we deal with it? 
Now we are saying that if we get gain or loss on realization, when? So we get gain or loss on realization under section 35, right? So that's how it happens. So you take your consideration, your consideration received. Okay, let's say my consideration received was 100,000. Then you take the cost. Okay, so less cost. So the cost of an asset is dealt with under section 36. So how do we do a cost of an asset? We first look at the cost of acquisition, production, manufacturing. Maybe we manufacture that it ourselves for 20,000 maybe, you know so. Then the next item, of course, is what? Did we alter it in any way? So cost of alteration or improvement or renovation. Maybe we altered the asset. We built a fence wall when we bought this land for 10,000 or so. Then three, incidental expenditure. Did we have any incidental expenditure like transfer, transfer taxes, maybe marketing agency, maybe an agent. We paid an agent to sell the land for, let's say, 50,000, right? So if we put this together, that means what? Our total cost for this asset is about 80,000. So we have a gain, right? You have a gain of what? 20,000, right? So this gain or realization, okay, there's a rule. If it, is ha it has to do with entities, we just add it back to the accessible income. But for individuals, as of now, okay, individuals have the option to either treat this separately, add it to its income, or tax it separately at 25% as of now, before it was 15% or add to income. So you get the idea. So individuals can add this to their income separately or tax it separately at 25%. And also, you see this 100,000, you can you have to withhold tax at 3% on it because it's consideration received. It's like a sale of what goods, right? So in that case, 3% withholding tax on it. Okay, so these are the rules around it. But if it were a loss under section 15, the same way again is added to your income, a loss will also be deducted from your income. Is that okay? So these are the rules that, with mostly deductions, these are the rules. Now, when it comes to R&D, R&D is an allowable deduction, right? But when it comes to petroleum and mining, remember, R&D is not. I'm just telling you, okay? But remember, if the R&D is something that involves the acquisition of an asset or is to be included in the cost of an asset, it depends on the policy of the organization. The law says it's allowed. Okay. okay. So when it comes to bad debts, remember bad debts are only allowed if they are specific. It means that you have followed the law. You have taken reasonable steps for recovery and then it couldn't suffice. You couldn't get it. If it follows and it meets all that criteria, you can allow. But general bad debt is a provision. Tax does not allow provisions. How can you tell me 5% of your debtors cannot pay you? Are you a magician? You, you, you get the idea. The law does not allow provisions or estimates. Rent. Check. Is the full rent for the business or part of it a portion? Legal and professional fees. When it comes to legal expenses in a question, okay, I'm telling you this, it can work for mining, it can work for any type of computation of income. That is why I'm going through this. Then we can call it a day, right? So when it comes to legal costs, right? If you incur legal and professional expenses, they are deductible if they are incurred in connection with trade. Are you getting an are related to capital expenses. So any legal and professional fees related to capital items is mo not mostly allowable, right? But if it has to do with something you are what? Defending rights or title to your asset, protecting your asset or collecting your trade debts, or you are addressing current company matters or related business issues like related uh, retainer fees, they are allowed, right? So remember, certain legal expenses are not permitted for deductions, right? Like when you get legal expenses for forming your company or partnership, or to sell or acquire property, income tax appeals, breaching the law, or fees arising from new issue of shares, they are not allowed, right? Advertisement expenses, they are allowed, but if it has to do with a permanent neon sign board, it's allowed. Education and training expenses, if only that education and training is going to improve your business. I'm an accountant. If I go and do ICA or CIT to improve what I have, I can charge it to my PNI, it's allowed. But if I go and learn sewing, it doesn't help improve my business. It's disallowed, right? So donations to a worthwhile cause, section 100. If you make donations or contributions to a worthwhile cause, right, in a given tax year, like a scheme of scholarship to develop a rural urban area, sports development or sports promotion, and any other thing which is of a worthwhile cause, the commissioner can allow you a deduction under section 100 for these, what, these expenses, right? 
Now, the thing is that you must get a written attestation or it must be approved, okay, to be, to, for you to enjoy this deduction. Now, the next thing is deduction for fresh graduates. Now, when it comes to fresh graduates, we are saying that a fresh graduate is somebody who has, what, graduated from a tertiary institution for the very first time, okay? And then the law allows us a deduction for what? A percentage of the fresh graduate salaries as an additional deduction. How does that work? It works this way. If the fresh graduates are up to 1%, okay, below 1% of your total population, then we give 10% deduction for the deduction, uh, the salary of the fresh graduate. So if you are paying them 10,000 and they are up to what? Let's say there were 10 employees, right? So they are up to 1% of your fresh graduate. So this 100,000, we are going to grant them what? 10% additional deduction which is 10,000, right? As an additional deduction against the income. If they are between 1% to 5% of your working population, right? We are going to get what? 30% deduction. It means that that 100,000, you are going to give them 30% deduction, right? Which is 30,000 as an allowable deduction. If they are above 5% of the workforce, you are going to give them 50% of their, the fresh graduate salary as allowable deduction, right? Which means that we give 50% of the 100,000, which is what? 50,000 as an allowable deduction. So these were the deductions. Now, when it comes to capital allowance, there are so many issues around capital allowance, which um, may waste time. But the whole thing is, you know capital allowance, you know the rate. The only confusion area around capital allowance is when it comes to leases. In simple terms, when you get a capital allowance on a lease, each installment treat it as an addition to the pool. What did I say? Each installment treat it as an addition to the pool. And any interest is an allowable deduction. That is how we do a capital allowance on lease and high purchase, right? Okay. So these are the issues. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and also when you buy non-commercial vehicles, limit it to 75000 Now, repairs and improvement. We know that repairs and improvement are limited to what? 5% of the pool's written down value at the end of the year, right? So it means that if you have a pool and you did repairs on it, okay? So let's say we have a pool, written down value for the pool was, let's say, 100,000 or so. And we did repairs of, let's say, 20,000 CDs. 20,000 CDs repairs were done on these um, items, right? So we are saying that, okay, if this was the pool, the pool, let's say it was a vehicle, pool two, right? If we take this, there were additions. Were there any additions? No, there were no additions, right? Let's say 100,000 becomes what? A depreciation basis. Then we grant capital allowance at what? Pool two, so 30%. So 30% will be 30,000 also. So that gives us 70,000 as what? The written down value at the, at the end of the year, right? This one, we say, well, take 5% of it. So 5% of the written down value becomes our allowable repairs. So 5% of the 70,000 becomes our allowable repairs, which is 3,500. Okay, then we compare it to what the amount that was charged in a financial statement, which was 20,000, right? So the excess, the excess of the amount, which is the 16,500, shall be disallowed and added back to the pool. So this is what we added to the pool, meaning it's capital expenditure, right? And then the, the, the allowable one, it's an allowable deduction, which will deduct from my financial statement, right? Okay, so that is repairs and improvements and capital allowance. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the incentives, okay? So incentives start with um, the maxims of tax planning, right? So when you hear the maxims or the variables of tax planning, these are factors that make tax planning possible. They are principles that make tax planning possible, right? Or principles of tax planning. So you remember this, you remember late, okay? So late, there's locational variable, okay? Which means you must put your business in a favorable location. That will give it a better tax exposure. Are you getting it? Activity variable. There are some kind of activities that when you do, it's going to save you taxes. Time variable, you can shape taxes into the future because of time. And entity variable, what kind of entity should you go into to reduce tax, right? So between partnership, so proprietorship, and then what? Companies, which one is better? It depends. As of now, uh, partnerships are taxed as individuals, right? The partners. And the tax differs 
between zero to thirty five percent. So if you do not, if it's a range, right? So if it falls anywhere be, below thirty five, you are this way. No, so it's good. It depends on where you falls. Company, remember, companies pay tax at twenty five percent and dividends at eight percent, leaving their tax liability at thirty three, right? So since individuals are between zero to thirty five percent and get all the reliefs and all the deductions, right? A company can be higher than a sole proprietor, okay, if only the person's tax was less than 33% in the graduation. But if the person is around 35, then it's better to form a company than to go for a sole proprietor or partnership. You get it. So remember to see this if this kind of business entity stuff. Okay, so remember late, locational variable, activity variable, time variable, and entity variable. Okay, so now let's go to some of the activity variables which I'll talk about the concessions or tax holidays. Some, country, some companies enjoy tax holidays. So when it comes to things like agriculture, agriculture, if you are into the farming of tree crops, okay, tree crops are trees like palm nut, palm plantation, coconut, rubber, share nuts, these ones, they are trees, okay? You pay 5% tax for the first 10 years from the date you make your first, your first harvest. Before June 2023 was 1%, but now you pay 5%. Remember, Tree crop, 10 years, date of first harvest. If you are into cattle farming, it's also 5%, 10 years, but cattle farming is not first harvest. It's commencement of business. We can't have this cut. Date of commencement, right? Okay, from date of commencement, 10 years for cattle. Livestock that are not cattle, five years, right? Commencement. Crop, cash crop farming. So cash crops are things that are not trees, right? Those ones like rice, something, all those things. They are also five years. So livestock, cash crop, and fish farming are all five years, date of commencement. Then when you have cocoa farming, the income of a cocoa farmer is specifically exempt from tax. Then we have processing, com uh, processing companies. If you are into agro-processing, processing of agricultural goods into semi-finished or finished product, right? It's five years also when you begin commercial production, okay? And cocoa byproduct, using cocoa hearts and cocoa skin and sub, sub uh, standard cocoa beans to make other things, right? It's also like agro processing. It also has five, five years where you pay 5% tax for those five years. Now, if you're into waste processing, when you process a uh, 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 waste, from the time the waste, you start your business, right? You pay 5% tax for seven years, okay? I hope that is okay. Then when it comes to banking, rural banking is also 10 years. You pay 5%. Residential premises or low-cost housing. If you are certified by the Ministry of Works and Housing for five years, are you getting it? You only pay 5% tax, right? Okay, now it's 5%, not 1%. Okay, then when it comes to financing, when you have approved unit trust schemes, mutual funds, and venture capital for a period of 10 years, you only pay 5% tax, right? Remember this. And when it comes to free zone companies, okay, remember, free zone companies, free zones also feature as part of your exam. So before you start your paper, just brush through the free zone incentives and Ghana Investment Promotion Center incentives. So I'm just going to go through them quickly to help you out with these incentives, right? So a free zone developer or an enterprise granted a license under the Free Zones Act is exempt from the payment of tax for the first 10 years from when it commences operation. So we are saying for the first 10 years, we are exempt from tax. And what incentives do free zone companies get, right? When it comes to monetary incentives, they are exempt from payment of direct and indirect duties, okay? So no duty payment. Then they are exempt from tax on their profit for 10 years. We just saw it. But after the 10 years, if it's an export free zone, he pays only 15%. And normal free zone companies will pay uh, 25, right? They are totally exempt from withholding tax from dividends arising out of free zone investment. There's relief from double taxation from foreign investors where Ghana has a DTA with them. For non-monetary ones, there's no import licensing requirement for them. There's minimal custom formalities. And anybody, whether foreigner or local, can own 100% of the shares of free zone companies. Not so. And free zone investors are permitted to operate foreign currency accounts in Ghana. Okay, one thing that you must understand is that they are guaranteed against expropriation. Government cannot take their properties anyhow, and these free zone companies to have amicable dispute settling procedures. Now, when it comes to Ghana Investment Promotion Center activities, okay, 
there are some strategic investments that you can come and do in the areas of agriculture, manufacturing, construction and building, mining and tourism, you get exemptions, you get incentives. Some of the incentives include exemption from import duties and plant and machinery, and plant and machinery, reduced tax rates, more favorable investment and capital allowance, reduction in your actual CIT or corporate income tax payable, and you have guarantees against expropriation by the government, including what? Amicable dispute settling proceedings. Now, apart from that, as part of your activities, companies can get not as part of GIPC or free zone, but generally, you must know the various corporate tax rates that companies generally pay tax of 25%, both listed and unlisted. But before it was 22, it is no more. If you are a trust, you, you are taxed like an entity, okay? Remember the taxation of trust, you are taxed as an entity. So all trusts still apply the normal deductions and everything, but trusts are taxed at 25%, right? But you must understand that if you have two or more trustees for a trust, okay, let's say that you are a trustee, but you are a trustee of different trusts, you shall account for each trust separately, okay? Even if you are the director or trustee for a lot of trusts, you shall account for them differently. But if it is a trust of an incapacitated individual, in simple terms, a minor, okay, if it is a child, then somebody must what? Carry out his activities on his behalf because he does not have the capacity to contract, right? So if it's a minor and he has a trust relationship, right, we shall compute it as if it's that it's a trust of an individual. So if it's an, an incapacitated individual, like a minor, then instead of taxing the trust at 25%, we'll use the graduated rate. That is the rule for tax and trust. Also, when you are looking at distribution of trust income for beneficiaries, any income or any distribution by a uh, a domestic or what? A resident trust to its beneficiaries are exempt from tax. But if the distribution is from a foreign trust, then it will be taxed, meaning to be added to the income of the beneficiary and taxed. So note, distribution by a local trust or what? A resident trust is exempt, but a foreign trust is taxed up. And also when you sell your stake in a trust, it's taxed up, right? Remember this. Petroleum and mining, we know they pay tax at 35. Hotel industry 22. Export of non traditional goods 8%. If you are a financial institution, we give loan to farming businesses. We pay tax at 20%. If you give loans to leasing companies, 20%. Remember this. Also, the next thing I want to talk about is young entrepreneur incentives. If you are a young entrepreneur and you are into the business such as manufacturing, IT, agro processing, energy production, waste processing, tourism, and creative arts, horticulture, and medicinal plants, you have five year tax holiday, you don't pay any tax. And after the five years, you pay your industry tax rate, right? But after the five years, if you locate in any of these regions, you are going to get what? Some locational incentives, right? Uh -huh. So let's first go to the locational incentives for companies which are into what? Agro processing and manufacturing. If you're a manufacturing company, which is the co most common type of question they are going to ask you. If you are into manufacturing, let's say you are located in Accra and Tema, you pay the normal 25% tax, right? If you are located in regional capitals outside Accra and Tema, you are going to get a 25% tax rebate on your 25%, meaning you are only going to pay 18.75% tax, right? If you are located elsewhere in Ghana, you pay 12.5% tax, right? Meaning that you are giving a 50% tax rebate. Now, if just like we saw the concessions earlier or the tax holidays, if you find yourself enjoying a tax holiday, right? And then after the tax holiday, you locate your business elsewhere, you can get some incentives. Now, this one only applies, the tax holiday thing, it only applies for cocoa byproduct businesses, agro processing, and farming, right? These are the only ones who enjoy post locational incentives. So let's say after my, I have a cattle farm, right? And I, for the first 10 years, I enjoyed. After the 10 years, I decided to relocate, right? If I locate in a current term, I only pay 20% tax. If I locate in other regional capitals outside the northern region, I pay 15% tax. If I locate outside the regional capital, I pay 10% tax. If I locate myself in the northern region, the three northern regions, I pay 5% tax, right? The same applies to young entrepreneurs. But for them, when they locate themselves in a current term and they pay 15%, Outside a current term, they pay 12.5 regional capital. And outside the regional capital, they pay 10%. The three northern regions, they pay 
So remember this when you are taking decisions, right? And this is mostly where they are going to ask you a lot of questions on because that is what your paper is about. Then something that has never been examined before is tax holidays for registered manufacturers and assemblers of cars, right? Now, if the person manufactures or assembles automobiles, when he has a car park, semi knockdown cars, he gets three years exemption from tax, right? So for three years, you exempt from tax. If it's completely knocked down vehicles, completely knocked down vehicles, it's 10 years from the commencement of the business. And also when you import plant and machinery to do your manufacturing or assembling of the cars, they are exempt from VAT upon importation. So when it comes to assemblers and what? The assemblers and the manufacturers of vehicles, remember three years if it's semi knocked down, completely knocked down 10 years, and they are exempt from VAT upon importation of materials for that. Now, one thing you must be careful, you must notice that when somebody wants to change from semi knockdown to completely knockdown, the incentive is aggregate. It means that if you have enjoyed three years, you only enjoy seven years more. But you not enjoy three and come and enjoy ten. It's cumulative. Okay, so that is one thing I want you to do. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is private universities. Private universities, if they plow back 100% of their earnings into their business, it's exempt from corporate tax. But how would you know? We can enjoy this investment or we can enjoy this deduction if only 100% reinvestment can be proven. We give evidence to the tax authorities, right? So these were all the incentives that you need and then the, the various deductions, right? Also, maybe I don't know whether they can ask you for uh, one district, one factory, but if you're into one district, one factory, you get some deductions and exemptions to like tax holiday for five years. They can waiver your import duties and levies on equipment. Industrial plants for one day, one day uh, have the uh, limited duties, not so. An enterprise whose plants and machinery are not zero rated under the Customs Act, not so, can enjoy this. 100% uh, exemption from payment of duties. Okay, total exemption from withholding tax or dividend and relief from double taxation. Okay, there are a lot of them, right? There are a lot of them. You get subsidies on interest rates as well. Okay, so that was it. And the last area I want to talk about is we've talked about trust charities. Okay, remember that the income of charities are exempt from tax. So if you have a charity, a club or society or what a religious institution, right? It's exempt from tax. That's the normal rule. But there are some conditions. Before you can do this, you have to apply for approval, right? Before your income will be exempt, you have to apply for approval from the commissioner. And what does it say? First of all, you must be set up as what? a charitable institution or a religious body of public nature, right? Before you enjoy this, you must set up as a religious institution or a charitable organization of public nature too. You must not do anything outside your constitution, meaning you must have what? A written constitution. Are you getting it? Have a written constitution that does not permit you to, are you getting it? Not use your platform to support party politics, meaning you cannot use your platform to support party politics or do political activity, right? You don't also have to do anything that confers a private benefit, right? So if you do anything that confers a private benefit, meaning that you are doing something that is outside your constitution. Now, if you do not follow this, the Commissioner General, even if he has given you approval, can revoke the approval, right? So the approval is that to approve you to exempt your income from tax. But if you do not follow these conditions, he may revoke the approval. And remember, it is only corporate income tax which is exempt, meaning that you have to withhold taxes. Okay, let's say you have staff, pay. You have to pay their pay as you earn. You have to file taxes. You have to pay other withholding taxes as well, right? So this exemption is only your corporate income tax. So that is about trust, which you are going to get a question on. Remember. We talk about these conditions if you want to get the full match, right? So that is it. Now, the last thing I want to talk about there, we can call it au revoir, is petroleum and mining. So first of all, let's start with petroleum businesses. So petroleum businesses means that we can start with what? The three types of petroleum activities or petroleum operations in Ghana. So when it comes to petroleum operations, there are three main types of petroleum operations. We start with the upstream sector, and the upstream sector has to do with some things. They do exploration, which is a search of crude oil, right? They go and search for crude oil when they are granted the license, right? And sometimes they dig exploratory wells. Once they do that, they must evaluate the land to see whether what 
there's oil in commercial quantities. We call that appraisal or evaluation. Once that is done, they, we start setting up machines, right? Which we call that development, okay? Then from that, we start what? Extracting oil, extraction of production of the oil, right? Where we draw the oil to the surface of the earth. This is the upstream sector. Now from that, the next is that after we've done all this, we've produced, we now start transporting, right? We transport the oil to the refinery, right? We transport to the refinery and we refine the oil, right? So transport and refinery is the mystery. And then the downstream sector, what they do is that they sell. So they do the sale and distribution, right? Downstream, that's all they do, sale and distribution, right? So the oil, the shell, the total, they are downstream. That's what we call the OMCs, right? You get OMCs before oil marketing campaigns. So these ones are all downstream activities. I hope that is okay. So those were the three types of petroleum operations. Now, apart from that, the next thing that they can ask you are the contract types, okay? How government can enter into contract for petroleum operations. So there are three main contract types, or you could say four, okay? The first is what we call the royalty tax system. So governments can institute a royalty tax system for petroleum contractors. And here, what happens is that when government gives you a license to operate, right? Any income, you will pay taxes on your income, and then you pay royalties on production, right? That's how this system works. Then we have what we call production sharing contracts. For production sharing contract, what happens is that the government will give you the license to operate, but what happens is that when you get your oil, you take a portion to cover your cost. So cost recovery or cost recovery, and that portion we call cost oil. So if you take a portion to cover your cost, whatever is left is shared with the host government. We call that profit oil, okay? So that's production sharing contract. Then we have something we call a service contract. Now a service contract is a contract that what? You come and do or drill oil for me for a fee, right? So you work for a fee, so the contractor works for a fee. So come and do it for a fee. And it could be a risk service where you share the risk with the economics, the economic risk with the state or a pure service contract where you don't bring any risk. You just what? Come and work for a fee, you the contractor. Then we have a hybrid system. A hybrid system is a system which is either a mixture of these, right? There's another system called what? Joint venture, right? Which we enter into partnership. So Ghana mixes joint venture with royalty tax system. So the examiner considers Ghana as what a hybrid system, which means Ghana applies royalty tax what system with what joint venture because GMPC on behalf of what Ghana is a joint venture partner in all petroleum operations. Apart from that, Ghana operates a royalty tax system as well. So how does Ghana make money from petroleum activities? Okay, so that is what we call the fiscal elements. Okay, you must understand this: the fiscal element. So Ghana makes. Uh, money from petroleum activities for, in different ways. Royalties is the first one. Now, royalties is the right to take what? Oil or if it's minerals from the surface of the earth or underneath the earth or in the sea, right? And that is the right to get to that. And royalties are giving us 5% on the gross value of petroleum or minerals one, right? I'm telling you this because most of the time, mineral royalties are part of the question. So, how do you do this? It means that when you get a mineral question, they'll tell you that, okay, this company has sales. Look at this. This company has sales of, um, so sometimes just get 5% of the gross income. So if you go, they may give you a question of mineral royalties. So get 5% of your gross income. So let's say sales was 100,000, right? And then we have cost of sales of, let's say, 80,000. So then we have net profit. Net profit becomes 20,000. Now the question can tell you that what? Included in sales is interest income, okay, of let's say 10,000. Now they say we should compute mineral royalties. Now, the mineral royalties I told you what is what 5% of the gross income. So, this one we can't say it's gross income because it includes interest. So, how much do we get for mineral royalties? Meaning that to get your mineral royalties, we need our gross income. And it says it includes interest. Meaning now gross income becomes what? The income only from the sale of the minerals. Meaning you take your 100,000 sales and less the interest of the 10,000 that was included. Meaning you have 90,000, right? So if you want to get your mineral royalties, your royalties are going to be given as what? 
five percent of the ninety thousand. Okay, so five percent of ninety thousand that gives us what? 0 0.05 times 90,000 as a mineral royalties. And that's 4,500, right? Remember, if there's royalties paid already, you can net them off to get your net royalties, right? So that's how we deal with mineral royalties. And the same applies to um, petroleum as well, right? But petroleum, so royalties, if you get them on quantity of minerals or quantity of oil, then you can calculate it. If not, use it as a percentage of the, what, the gross income. And for mineral companies, that's what you get. A typical uh, question like this, right? Where they give you a financial statement and you have to compute the mineral royalties. royalties. Remember, mineral royalties uh, allow you deductions. Mineral royalties are, are allow you deductions for both petroleum and mining companies. Mineral royalties are allowable deductions. I'm telling you this because when you get the question, a lot of students, after computing the royalty, fail to include them as part of their deduction. Right. So remember, so apart from royalty, the next type of income government can make, government can make petroleum income taxes, right? So petroleum income taxes are ways government can make money. Government can make money from what we call additional oil and title, which means that you, you get an additional tax when oil production exceeds some limit, right? Then you have something we call what? Surface rentals, right? So you pay rent for the surface of the see that they give you to go and drill oil, right? Then another way government can make money is through technology allowance. So technology allowance is paying GMPC some amount per year to acquire local technologies for you. Then we have training allowance where GMPC trains people on your behalf and you have to pay them this allowance. And then we have carried interest Okay, which is an automatic interest government has in all petroleum operations, okay, and only contributes towards production. The government only contributes towards production, and this one is ranging between ten percent to fifteen percent. Right? Okay, so that is it. It's an automatic interest, so sometimes it's called initial interest. Government has this in every petroleum operation that comes to Ghana. Then, if government wants an additional interest, there's something called additional participating interest, right? So this additional participating interest, government gets an additional interest, right? Which means it will still contribute additional investment to production and development, right? And this is mostly 5%, okay? And because of this contribution, when they pay any distribution, government enjoys because it's a joint venture partner. This is the reason why we say Ghana operates a hybrid system because this means Ghana a joint venture partner because of the contribution it makes in petroleum operations to enjoy their returns. Apart from that, we have what we call bonus. So a bonus is a lump sum that is paid to enjoy a right, right? So a bonus can be a signature bonus, which is a lump sum we pay to obtain a petroleum right, or it could be what? And uh, a production bonus, which when your production gets to some part, you pay this lump sum. And note, all bonuses are capitalized. Bonuses are not allowable expenses. Okay, so these are the fiscal elements in our petroleum operations. They can ask you. So the next thing I want to talk about, then I can call it today, is distribution of crude oil. Okay, so when they ask you to distribute crude oil, the question comes like this. So let's say distribution of crude oil. I'll give you a simple rule, a simple illustration, or a simple question. Then we use it to distribute crude oil. So let me see. So when it comes to distribution of crude oil, I'll give you a simple illustration then we learn how to distribute crude oil so that when the question comes from that part, you can deal with it. So let's say in the petroleum agreement, right, we have uh, party A. So let's say we have party A who contributed 50%. We have party B. Okay, these are the terms. Who contributed 35%. Then we have initial interest by government. Okay, initial interest by government, 10%. We have additional interest. Let's say there was additional interest of 5%. Then there was what? Royalty. Okay. There was royalty here of what? Let's say five percent. Okay, Ghana uses a sliding scale royalty, meaning royalties differ between five to fifteen percent. It depends on arrangement, but mostly five percent is what you see. Then, let's say that the production barrels. Let's see the production barrels that we produce, right? So let's say they produce hundred thousand barrels. So this is what you have, and they said distribute the crude oil, right? Distribute the crude oil. So let me just give you development. We have development expenditure. 
of um, 120,000, and you have what exploration expenditure of let's say 20,000. Okay, this is what you have. Now, with this being said, let me give you price of crude oil. The price of crude oil to be $50, and then the cost per barrel to be $30, right? This is what we have. So the first thing is, let's try to distribute this crude oil based on this arrangement of the 100,000 barrels. So in that case, distribution of crude oil works like this. The distribution of crude oil works like this. So first of all, we get our gross production. How many barrels did we produce? We produce 100,000 barrels, not so. Then we less royalties. So royalties was 5% of the 100,000, right? So royalties give me what? 5,000, meaning I have what? 95,000 as my net production. So I get my net production to be what? 95,000. Then distributed as follows, right? Now I share for the patents, right? So how do I distribute this? I first take GMPC, who is the first part, and GMPC contributed in the form of initial interest. His initial interest was what percentage? It was 10%. So he gets 10% of this 95,000, right? Which is 9,500. Then he will get what? Additional interest. So his additional interest will be what? 5% of the 95,000, which is what? Four seven fifteen also. Then we now take partner A. Realize that partner A contributed fifty percent, so he gets fifty percent of the ninety five thousand also, which is forty seven five hundred. And then partner B gets thirty five percent of what the ninety five thousand. So you see, the ninety five we are selling, we are sharing for all of them. So point three five by ninety five percent. By 95,000, sorry. That's 33,250. Okay, so you share all for them. And that still gives you 95,000 you are sharing, right? Meaning that there's nothing remaining. So that's how you share. Now, the next thing that you have to do, that's how we share crude oil. If they tell you to compute the taxes for these companies, we first have to look at development and exploration activities. Now, the rule under section 65 says something that if you incur any capital or revenue expenditure before commencement of production, okay, before commencement of production in petroleum and mining activities, they are going to be what? Put into a single pool. So we put into a single pool before commencement of production. Are we getting? So you put all this into a single pool before commencement of production. And when production begins, all these ones in the pool, you add everything up and grant capital allowance at 20%, right? Or over five years. 20% means five years, right? So this is one thing you must understand. So for petroleum and mining, we grant capital allowance at what? We grant capital allowance at what? 20% over five years. The reason why I'm saying over five years is because since you are doing straight line, it means that if production commenced two years ago, it means the asset have three years remaining. So if you want capital allowance, you can just take the rating down value over the three years, and that gives you the capital allowance you wanted to get, right? So these are the basic rules that you have to understand when it comes to these things. Okay, so be prepared when a question comes around that area. So if they want you to get your capital allowance based on what we have done here, what I gave you here, these development costs, you can split it for the partners, okay? Split the exploration costs for the partners, okay? And then you add them up and grant capital allowance. But you see these barrels I have shared for A and B. If you want the sales, it's this one times the selling price, the 47,500. And then if you want the cost, it's 47,500 times the cost. So you take the sales, less the cost, and less capital allowance, which is also an allowable deduction, right? Get your profit, tax it at 35%. So that is it. Okay, so I think overall, it was an effective session. Yeah, Tina, your hand is up. You can talk. Um, I was going to ask when you are 
do but i i don't know so where you your are voice sharing... is far away can you amplify your voice a little you said your voice is far away can you please amplify your voice a little tina okay please my question is where government is having a additional interest mm -hmm. we were told that government have to pay for production and then um Development. Uh, development. So yeah. where you are sharing the cost for the partner? No, no, no. Where you are sharing, government is not part. Don't worry about government. In the question, government is the one receiving the money. So you don't need government's part. Meaning that if I'm sharing, for instance, exploration, government never contributes towards exploration, right? So it's between A and B, right? And A yes. contributed 50%, um, B contributed 35, right? If I add it, that means I'm spreading over 85%, right? So the exploration of the the exploration of the uh, 120,000, I'll split it, what, by 50 over, what, 85, and then, what, by, what, 35 over 85. Do you get it? But when I come to the development expenditure, remember development, government contributes towards development in additional interest, meaning that the ratio now becomes 50 plus 35 plus the 5, Meaning that we are spreading everything over nine. Okay, thank you. That's what I want to know. That uh -huh. when it comes to explore uh, development, you have to consider government. Yes, of course, we consider government. So Fifty out of ninety now by the development, and the other party becomes what thirty-five out of ninety times the development expenditure. Right? That's how we share. When you finish, you add them. You add the development and exploration for each partner, and then grant capital allowance at twenty percent. Right? So the last thing which I think you should be concerned about tax administration, I'm not going to say anything there. You've learned tax administration either way, but it's ethics. Please, when you go, if ethics comes, it will mostly be part of almost every question. Okay, meaning somebody has done something wrong. And then you just have to identify whether the person has breached people, right? He has breached integrity. There was no honesty. Maybe he was hiding something from the tax authorities. Maybe he wasn't competent. If somebody is not competent, it's because of two things, three things. Either he didn't have enough resources, enough time, or enough information, right? That could make him not to be competent. Maybe there was confidentiality, and tax has to do with confidentiality. Maybe not disclosing to not disclosing information to the tax authorities, right? So section seven of the Revenue Administration Act talks about official secrecy. Okay, meaning that if you work with the GRE or you've come across a document in connection with your work with the GRE, you should keep it secret until the Commissioner General has allowed you to authorize a disclosure or to disclose, right? Remember confidentiality. Then when it comes to objectivity, do not allow any bias to cloud your judgment. So maybe you are working for two clients, you are carrying out an audit, right? And you are working for people, make sure that you do not allow bias or conflict of interest. And they can ask you for ethical threats in a scenario. When it comes to the threat, be careful. So, self-interest. Was there some gift and hospitality? Was there some bonuses or some incentives that you are going to enjoy? That's why you're ignoring the trend. So, self-review. Maybe you're a tax auditor, right? And you're the same person or you're an officer of GRE in the scenario. And you're the same person coming to check the tax returns or prepare the tax returns for the taxpayer. Check it. Advocacy is where you are seen to be promoting your client. Maybe promoting your client or defending him. Are you a lawyer? Check that in the scenario. Familiarity. Long or close business relationship, right? Maybe you've worked with this person for a very long time. You become familiar with him. Then we have what? Integrity. Uh, uh, intimidation. Intimidation is the common type. Where the taxpayer is giving you pressure, okay, to do something for him. Pressure or threat. He's threatening you or he has put you under stress, duress, right? All these things constitute intimidation. So in the case, just open your eyes and look out for these things if ethics should come up in your scenario. Oh, please, uh, can you touch on that? You said competence. Either you don't have enough resources, uh, the reads that you put there. information or enough time. Right. Resources, information, and time are the threats to competence. Exactly. I've covered question one to five. Have I not done well? Okay. You have done well, but Prof, I'm still not getting the uh, yeah. the competency and then the the reach the, the enough. If you don't have enough I resources, said enough the time. Resource. Listen, if okay, you didn't pass your tax exam. Why? Meaning you were not competent. What didn't make you competent? It's either you didn't have enough resources to attend class, right? Two, 
either you didn't you may have resources but you didn't have enough information about what i'm doing three you could have enough information but you didn't have enough time to attend class or attend the uh, last thank minute on a rush you. right thank you. so these things will not make you competent or you will not make you exercise due professional care and skill in what you are doing do you understand now yeah i do thank you that is fine so may the lord be with you and i hope to see you with good news have, have uh, a blessed day and may the lord be with you throughout thank you smile seen smile sound right? okay sure but I hope it was a fruitful session. Yes, sir.